from just outside the Empire City at the crossroads to the northeast. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you are and whenever you are, this is your premier podcast for all things unknown, not media, and I'm your host, JP. Welcome to Not Media. Today we have a very special guest, Christopher O'Brien. Christopher has investigated over 1,000 paranormal events reported in the San Luis Valley from 1992 to 2002, resulting in him writing three books, which are called the Mysterious Valley Trilogy. These books include The Mysterious Valley, Enter the Valley, and Secrets of the Mysterious Valley. He is also the author of the books Stalking the Tricksters and Stalking the Herd, the second of which objectively examines the unexplained livestock death phenomenon, one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. His meticulous field investigations of paranormal events include unexplained livestock deaths among many other subjects, and he has produced one of the largest databases of unusual occurrences gathered from a single geographic region. Christopher has also been involved with uh, and has written articles in dozens of media projects, a few of which of those are Coast to Coast AM, UFO Files, Deadly Waters, The Rocky Mountain News, UFO Magazine, World Explorers Club, and The Tucker Carlson Show. I believe uh, a one of the uh, times that Tucker Carlson covered a, a paranormal uh, event or situation or f- phenomena. Welcome, Christopher, to Not Media. How are you? Um, good. You know, thanks for having me um, on. Uh, let's get down to it. Uh, Great to have you here. Yeah, uh, just, good to be just, here. Just, just real quick, um, the list of, of your work is impressive, and it shows your objective uh, nature and your thorough uh, research. And one other thing that I was going to ask you that I was so when I was reading through your book, uh, there was for your biography, one thing, uh, and your book, another thing. For, I'll start off with the book. Um, it said that, were you a police officer in the early 1980s? No, no, I've never been a cop. I, I, I was an unofficial deputy of weirdness for five county sheriffs. Okay. Uh, so oftentimes when people would call in with UFO reports, uh, cattle mutilation reports, depending on the county, they would um, sometimes just refer them directly to me or they would um, go out, check it out, and then call them, call me my, uh, themselves or have the rancher call me or whatever. It, it varied on, you know, between counties. But uh, there were a couple, three counties that said, you know, if anybody calls about any of this stuff, just give them Chris's number. Yeah. I could see that, you know, just, just having such great research and having such a, uh an objective nature that they would call you to be the specialist because if the, if the local law enforcement doesn't know where to go with it, you know, what are they going to tell the people? You know, that's a lot of times why they make up cover stories because they don't have an answer. And it's a lot easier to have a cover story for someone than it is to have an answer, you know, especially well, in a, I, I in think a strange that's why, situation. That's why I was so um, successful in, in, in actually being able to, find out about, you know, all these various reports and, and people's, people's experiences simply because I was a local, um, you know, people could call me with a local phone, phone number, uh, back pre-cell phones, of course, uh, long distance, uh, between counties, uh, could be 14, 15 cents a minute. So, uh, you know, it was important, uh, for people, you know, to realize that they did have a local person that, um, would honor their request for anonymity and then uh, credit them for any leads if that's what they wanted. Uh, and so, you know, word got around when the cops trust you, generally the, uh, you know, the, the people in the community trust you. So, yes, um, I was very fortunate to, um, you know, not come across like some crazy uh, UFO nut uh, or crazy person that, uh, these people realized that I was really attempting to look at this scientifically, look at this dispassionately, not run around like a chicken without a head, calling all the media outlets to, to let them know that, you know, 
the man was on the case and all this stuff that yeah. some investigators out there uh, tend to do. And uh, this lends itself to people trusting you uh, and, and people uh, confiding in you. And so over between 92 and 2002, that 10 year period, um, geez, at the height of it, I think in, in 98, if I remember, I had 17 phone calls uh, reporting five separate uh, events. Wow. Uh, in, a, in a single day. So, wow. That gives that you an idea of how, how active the area was. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that. That was my right. And you're not on anybody's payroll. So, that's on your own time, no. basically, All as a paranormal time, investigator. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, I read in your bio that uh, you were working with a team of specialists to install some high tech or video uh, uh, video surveillance uh, in the San Luis Valley. Is this project finished, or is this an ongoing project? It's an ongoing project. Um, actually, UFODAP, uh, U F O D A P, uh, UFODAP dot com is our website. If you want to go check it out, oh, wow. um, UFODAP is the UFO Data Acquisition Project, and um, I started it, uh, geez, 15, 16 years ago. And um, about five years ago, I, um, I joined forces with an engineer named Ron Olch out in California, who's an inventor, computer scientist, um, and a very smart, up-to-speed UFO uh, investigator. And, you know, he was willing to, to do 100,000 lines of code and create all the software uh, to put together, a, you know, the first civilian um, effort to properly investigate UFOs scientifically. And what we have is uh, triangulated uh, cameras that operate, uh, you know, talk to each other over the Internet. And um, we have special software that's like targeting so software for the mil excuse me, for the military. So it'll it'll identify an un, unknown object in the air. Um, we've been about four four years now. We've been using uh, computer uh, artificial intelligence and computer learn techniques to train the software to differentiate between um, birds, airplanes, helicopters. So it has enough. Uh, computing power and learning, uh, deep learning, that enables it to go ahead and discriminate between events. So if it's an un unknown event, it'll turn everything on into record mode. And along with the three cameras, up to six cameras, uh, which will wheel around and all focus on the same event. There's a recording magnetometer, which will change, uh, look for changes in the Earth's magnetic field. There's accelerometers, which will look for any sort of per perturbations in the gravitational field. Um, there's a radio frequency spectrum analyzer, which will look for any sort of weird um, spe radio spectrum uh, anomalies. Uh, we have a complete uh, environmental um, information, you know, wind speed, if you have a, a wind, uh, you know, one of those whirly bird things for the wind, uh, uh, temperature, humidity, um, we've got analog blaze gratings uh, to divide the light spectra at night into frequencies. I mean, it's it's really a sophisticated uh, open source way to have a mini scientific station at your disposal that will uh, look at the sky continuously and discriminate between mundane events and real high strange events. We're currently in 14 countries, and we have setups in 66 different setups um, in, I think, 18 states and 14 countries. So wow. this is quietly becoming, uh, you know, That's I extensive. Mean, it's, it's historic. Uh, no one has ever yeah. <laughs> even come close yeah, yeah. to doing something like this. So That's we're starting to finally yeah. collect some pretty interesting data. Um, the person that gets a system. We don't make any money off of it. You can go, you can get an entry level system for as little as three hundred dollars, and then oh, uh, wow. the sky's the limit for the top. If you want to go with radar and forward looking yeah. red and some of the the bolt-ins and 
add-ons. Yeah, and they say jack it up. But in in the UFO world, you know, going to the infrared spectrum, a lot of times they I've heard that that uh, reveals a lot more. Uh, yeah, data yeah, than just add than in the visible light spectrum. The price tag. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it sounds tremendously expensive. Also, yeah. I heard, I recently heard a whole thing. I was listening to Coast to Coast, and I heard a whole one of the guests had a whole segment on where a gentleman came on, and he was talking all, all strictly about infrared cameras and uh, night vision cameras, and you know, just. But it's he was also talking about the price tag of like the newer generations of infrared yeah. and night vision and just how tr- tremendously expensive it, it could get you know when you're yeah, uh, but, dealing but, with this sort of who technology. cares i mean the best stuff's a, during the day anyway so i mean yeah the be- okay your best uh, your highest quality data will be daylight sightings that are triangulated by by multiple uh, optical uh, detectors and then and then of course the corresponding uh, magnetometer and or magnetic and, G, uh, and gravitational data that's that's the stuff that scientists want to want to look at. So, okay, you know, we're, great. We're, we're working with a, you know, with a, a couple of scientists from the University um, of Ohio, or is it Ohio State? I forget. One of the Ohio uh, big schools, and then um, the some of the guys in Kufos, the Computer you know, or the uh, Center for UFO Studies, which is started by J. Allen Hynek, uh, the famous advisor to Project Blue Book, all through the. 50s and 60s, um, uh, they were going to do something similar to UFO DAP. We beat them to the punch, and so they yeah. said, "Hey, you know, why not have us be your data analyzers, and uh, you guys, you know, feed us the data, and then we'll help you figure out what the heck we're looking at." So um, it's the best of both worlds. Um, the um, what's the SCU folks, the uh, Scientific uh, Center for UFO. Uh, research. They've um, they've gotten on board. We actually uh, presented a uh, at their conference a couple years ago, and and it's one of the reasons why we've been able to s- spread around the world so quickly. We're we're in four yeah. f- five. We're on five continents. We're in uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, uh, all the way up in Finland. Uh, it's it's really it's quite gratifying to see that uh, this is taking off. We don't make money at it. Uh, the only money that's really made is by Ron because he put in so much time developing his software. He's charging ninety dollars for the software suite, which is, you know, way below market value. Believe me. Yeah. And all uh, things all considering, that comes with all the patches and the updates and everything too, continuously. I'm sure all things considering for the amount of time that he actually put into this project. You know, be charging ninety dollars for something like that doesn't seem like it's all that much. No, it's a nominal amount of money, and uh, yeah. we've already been featured in uh, a number of television shows. Uh, Skinwalker Ranch; those guys are using it to help uh, with their surveillance equipment. Uh, Beyond, Skinwalker yeah, I was watching Ranch. that show. Beyond Skin- Skinwalker Ranch is a new show that I'm going to be working with for their new season. Um, th- that's their main. Uh, tool for investigation is uh the ufo ufo dap or ufo das the ufo data acquisition system yes yeah. um is what they're using now you know people have of, often called me a ufologist and i i just cringe when i hear that word uh i i really i don't consider myself a ufologist by any stretch i'm i'm an investigative journalist and an anomalist and uh but if i was a ufologist i'd be doing something like ufo dap and yeah. um, so <laughs> my my gift to the ufological community, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm the Rodney Dangerfield of ufology. I was funded by Lawrence Rockefeller for two years. I've been on Tucker Carlson a couple times, so, you know, Inside Edition Extra. I've done some real super mainstream highfalutin stuff. And yet I'm I'm the one guy nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> yeah. It's well, funny how it works. I should be calling the media and promoting myself and creating a cult of personality around myself, right? For, it looks like from all the time that you've put into this, uh, you know, I read about your different books and, you know, uh, getting getting into what we're uh, going to talk about today. Um, so what was your biggest influence of getting into paranormal uh, uh, research? I know Linda Moulton Howe was investigating the topic. And, you know, just for all of our guests today, um, a big 
part of the um, topic that we're going to be talking about is going to be uh, animal uh, mutilation, uh, mutilations, specifically cow uh, mutilations, which has been something that has been a huge mystery. Um, not only not all over the world, but also specifically, uh, it almost seems like ground zero is in the Southwest where Christopher um, was investigating in the San Luis Valley, which is going to be in northern uh, New Mexico. What is it? Northeastern, north central to northeastern New Mexico and south uh, central uh, Colorado. No, it's both both in the center of the state. Oh, it- um, the San Luis Valley okay. goes from just below the center of the state. And okay. it's a, about a 140, 40 foot long alpine valley that goes down in the tip of it's in New Mexico. All right. Um, so what was your biggest influence getting into the, uh, uh, paranormal, uh, research? I know um, being, in the 70s, being followed around my neighborhood at three in the morning when I was six years old by non-human entities, I wouldn't okay. have done any of this unless that had happened. Oh, so you actually had an experience. Oh yeah. You felt uh, that. So, so can you yeah. just tell us about that qu- uh, uh, quickly? Uh, yeah, I, I woke up, I noticed this glittering, uh, light, uh, these vertical lights that were uh kind of the sort of towards the foot of my bed and uh when my eyes got used to what what it was i i was mesmerized by it uh it was a multicolored light that was shooting up and down uh what appeared to be like glass rods um they were being held by three non-human entities and there was one a, a slightly taller one in the back that was kind of hiding um, the glittering light uh, was bright enough so that it actually shone on the on the, the front of the figures, and uh, of course I instantly you know ducked my head under the covers and popped my head back up to see if I had been dreaming, and I hadn't been dreaming. They had actually by in that brief moment they had actually moved to the very foot of my bed. Um, of course, at this point I was freaked out and uh, I ran out of the room up the stairs. Turn, turned around, you know, at the, up to the landing of the front, you know, by the front door of the house. And I was going to grab the banister to whip around the banister and go up the next four stairs to go up to my parents' room and jump into their bed. And they were waiting at the top of the four stairs for me. They had somehow beat me up there or it was another group. I, 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 I don't know. Um, I was forced to go outside uh, to try to get around over the around the backyard. My parents had their own separate entrance in the back of the house, but they headed me off and I ended up uh, going to my neighbors. Uh, This is three in the morning. Um, I stood out in the middle of my one, I banged on my first neighbor's door. Nobody woke up. I went out in the middle of their big, huge yard and and waited for these things. I could see them coming after me. Um, They were like checking me out. They were following me. I, I didn't ever get any uh, communication from them. I never got um, any sort of indication of what their agenda was, why they were there. Um, They just seemed to be checking me out. And uh, so I stood out in the middle of the lawn and and my my parents, my neighbors, the the people I just pounded on their door, they had like a a pretty powerful farm light that was shining down on their uh, driveway. And so I wanted to, see if I could get them to go through the light so I could get a, a better look at them. Yeah. And, um, and they came to the edge of the light and, and I could see that they were, I called them stick men. They, they were impossibly skinny. Uh, they had big heads. I don't remember the eyes for some reason. Um, they were, had these, they were about three and a half, four feet tall. It was the same height as me. Actually, I was six at the time, almost seven. And uh, they had these these glittering spears, I call them light spears. <laughs> and uh, and they came to, they came to where the light was, you know, on the ground from the street light, because it was it was kind of a, it, it was more of a it was very directional light. It didn't it wasn't like a real street light. It had more of a directional beam coming down, and so they they paused at the edge of the light, and then they turned sideways and came through the light like thin little lines like they didn't have any depth like they were two-dimensional or something like paper paper uh, dolls or something well of course when i saw that 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 freaked me out and uh 
And the last thing I remember is pounding on my the next neighbor down, pounding on their door. And I remember their porch light came on. But next thing I know, an indeterminate amount of time later, my sister was rescuing me like four or five houses away. I have no idea how I got there. And uh, uh, no, I've never had uh, anything like this happen uh, before or since. Uh, I did have a weird experience that happened in 1989 when I was fossil hunting in southern Utah, uh, way deep in the desert uh, of southern Utah. And um, I went to stay and guard in the car because we, we were hearing the weird scurrying sounds around our tent. And uh, yeah, I went, I went ahead and sat in the car. And next thing I, you know, I, I was looking around the car with a flashlight and I, I kind of looked forward and boom uh the light was still on in my hand and, and six hours had gone by so <laughs> oh wow so <laughs> when you told your fa- did you tell your family what what, what no, happened here what was the oh yeah what was the what was the the, the reaction my from parents your said, sister? Oh, you were sleepwalking you had a nightmare uh, my my sister said i was so freaked out that when she, when she brought me back into the house uh my sister was 18 i i was six okay um, she said, um, I, I refused to go back down to my, my bedroom. And, uh, yeah, my, my brother and I had bedrooms in, in the basement. And, uh, and so she says, well, hop into bed with me and, and you can sleep here. And, and she said a short time later, after I'd fallen asleep, I tried to nurse her. <laughs> so it oh, gives you kind wow. of an idea of how freaked I was. Um, wow. she, she always thought that it was a real experience. My parents, you know, they, they never gave, paid much attention to it. My little five-year-old brother, he believed me, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, I was, I was a and, really smart kid. I learned how to read when I was three. I was doing uh, reproductions of Van Gogh paintings when I was five. Uh, yeah. I was a pretty did, on the ball little kid. And did you ever make any sense of like this experience? Why this might, may have no, happened to you? No, or... not, none whatsoever. There's no craft associated with it. There's no, uh, anything the strangest else. Thing. Uh, huh? Yeah. It, it, it's just, yeah. Uh, it's uh, just usually, um, you know, it's like as people get older, sometimes they have like a, a, a reoccurring experience of something like that. They were able to try to figure out some sense to it, you know, like why this may have happened or why, you know, this, this yeah. sort of sighting or occurrence. But it definitely gave you the um, drive to want to look into some strange events that 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 were going on <laughs> in, in the area. I, I read which every is, every available book on UFOs by the time, which I was is important. 10. Yeah, yeah, because this is not a topic you would have been exposed to other than actually having to go through something strange like that or having a, a paranormal a, a experience. Um, let me uh, just moving forward. Um, as far as um, the mutilations, what 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 was the uh, impetus? At what point did you go from uh, being in, in interested in paranormal events or just any of the in, the information you were researching? And then how did this overlap? At what point in your no, life? I, I know uh, exactly how it did. Uh, when I was ten years old uh, in October, early November, uh, nineteen sixty seven. Um, I was standing in line at Safeway with my mom, ready to check out with a with a load of groceries, and uh, I, I noticed the Inquirer or the World uh, World News uh, Daily or yeah, you know, one of those supermarket rags that you see. Um, I think it was the Inquirer. It had this lurid photograph of these three people looking down in this woman pointing at a mutilated horse and all the skin was gone from the tip of its nose to, to its shoulders, all the tissue, all the hide, all the muscles, connective tissue, et cetera. And, um, it had this big, you know, glaring headline in quotes, flying saucers killed my horse. And, uh, man, I'll tell you, I, I dogged my mom for a quarter or 50 cents or however much it was to buy the magazine so that I could read the, the article, which turns out to be, uh, you know, one of the many articles that were published at that, um, you know, during that fall about the Snippy the Horse case, which, which occurred uh, on September 8, 1967. And 
in the San Luis Valley where I ended up moving, not because of Snippy, but I ended up moving there in 1989. And uh, I remember as a 10 year old reading that article, just freaking out going, holy moly, if they're coming down and doing this to horses, I wonder if they're doing it to people too. You know, it, it was it yeah was a huge impression in my mind. And I kept that article for years just, because it was such a, you know, it was such a bizarre thing. I had a scrapbook of, of paranormal events and UFO sightings. I read Valet and Keel and uh, John Fuller and, you know, Frank Scully. Um, I read all these guys. Uh, and there you go. Uh, yeah. And I don't think you have the actual picture that I saw. I, I do have a copy. Okay, so there was like, another picture. Yeah, this was taken from your book, and this is Christopher's book, uh, "Stalking the Herd." This is uh, still your most recent book, correct? Yeah, it's a it's a six hundred page a comprehensive history. Uh, you know, it even goes into the background of um, how far uh, along there was some history. There was some great history in the book. I mean, we even talked about bullfighting and how uh animals like cattle have been domesticated for what was it about 10.5 thousand years well, the, yeah almost twelve thousand. but who's counting oh t t uh, yeah uh, so almost twelve thousand years ago was when cows were first domesticated and then it went into the history of how cows have influenced uh us in the modern day um there was even the history of bullfighting about how um the first bullfight was to honor the coronation of king alfonso the third in um 1113 AD and um, now it's what is there 250,000 cows a year killed it's there's a number cited it was saying all the cows kill every year in a bullfighting yeah you it's know. still it's still quite quite uh, popular and mostly uh, Spanish speaking countries uh, I had no idea the number was that high yeah I, I think it's it's uh, it's it's been ratcheted down somewhat now. Because okay. of the uh, the animal cruelty, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, so there's there's quite a number of people that, that aren't really fond of this so-called sport. It's it's quite inhumane uh, treatment of of animals. I would but, say so. It's like don't. It's basically like they torment the animal and they slowly kill yeah. it, right? Yeah, it's, I think it's, I think yeah, it's really I think like uh, bull riding, like the PBR, uh, is is a much more fair. Because <laughs> number one, the bull is actually competing as well, and is being yeah. is being uh, scored, and uh, you know they got a chance. They got you know a chance to get back at the cowboy, and <laughs> right and, uh, at least a, at least a little shot. I mean, it seems like with the with the other way around with bull riding, they at least get to stick them with the horns if they can. That's why they got the uh, rodeo no, clowns, right? The rodeo stamp on them. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, rodeo clowns are there to kind of try to save the uh, the, the uh, bull rider, right? That's the purpose of no, the rodeo the clowns. clowns. Don't save anybody. It's the bullfighters oh. that save. They're, oh, okay. they're officially called bullfighters. The guys that what the three what guys do the clowns do? There. Huh? What do the clowns do then? Like, what's their what, what what's their objective? The uh, rodeo they, clowns. They just entertain the crowd. Um, oh, jeez. They get in the barrel and let the the bull knock them around a little bit. They uh, run around and. And uh, make jokes and and uh, and they seem like they're they're the they're uh, putting themselves yeah the they're tricksters. they're uh, putting themselves at risk uh, just like the bull rider except they don't get all the glory yeah yeah well they're tricksters uh, clowns okay. and uh, uh, are are the the only real remaining vestige that we have of the ancient trickster forms uh, the Hyoka yeah. of the Native Americans or the Lokis of Scandinavia uh yeah it's a real interesting shot there um i this was, was researching i was researching trying to find the earliest evidence of mutilations and this is from eight thousand years ago in the tassili frescoes in algeria and it's actually a this is just the the uh, kind of a detail of the far right side of the fresco the fresco is is actually a drawn herd of about a hundred animals, and at the very front yeah. of the herd is this scene that you see, and I put an arrow to indicate the severed rear leg there. And, I saw uh, that, yeah. Or actually, it's a, I think it's a severed front leg. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. You'll notice like the, the other arrow. Leg. There's this little ghostly like being 
that doesn't yeah, look that like thing? any of the other uh, humanoid figures. Uh, they purposely did that, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a different type of creature. And it's got its back to the other cattle, and it seems to be using some sort of implement uh, to cut into the animal. And yeah. uh, you'll see the guy at the back appears to be, uh, I mean, it's like he's reaching inside the the animal. Yeah, um, that's what it looks like. When I saw this, I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe that I, I had the the good fortune to discover this particular detail because it's if you see the whole a picture of the whole fresco this is just one little tiny part of it uh, you know albeit an important part but it is uh the the main attraction of this particular large image in in the in the cave system um is the hundred or so cows you can see the the black uh cows at the top and bottom they're the yeah. leading cows of the bulls of this long line of, of cows that are moving along. And then this is a scene that you, that you see at the front. Now, you know, your average archaeologist or paleontologist would look at this and, and say, well, it's actually a depiction of a slaughtering of a cow. And, and uh, I disagree. I think it's something way more uh, indicative of a high strange event. Uh, the, the mannerism of the guy in the bottom t uh, taunting the cattle, you know, saying, come on, come, get you you know, do something about it, you know. And then the guy trying to stop him from doing that and then somebody holding him back from stopping him. Uh, there, there's I some see that. serious iconography going on here. And That's I, strange. I, yeah, yeah. It, it, I, it's, it, it doesn't conform to a, any sort of scene that you can easily explain. Uh, with a simple uh, butchering of a cow, uh, especially because it's at the at the lead point of of, of a large group of of, of animals. So um, this is probably our earliest depiction of a animal mutilation, arguably. Okay. And, uh, and and uh, what year? Again, what year was was this, uh, this um, is, estimated? Uh, roughly Continued? around five thousand five hundred BC, six thousand BC. Wow, so this is quite old, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's old. <laughs> yeah, and 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 that would be and and where was this found again? Because that would in, be around the time of, of like uh, Mesopotamia, right, or the five no, six thousand no, ago. Okay, so okay, so Algeria. Look at this. Yeah. Wow. So that silly, is quite the, interesting. The silly plateau, and the, they're called it the silly fresco. Oh. Very, very interesting. And then moving into the modern day, I read in your book that we had uh, 1797. There was a man named Alexander Hamilton, apparently no relation to the uh, politician or founding father of the U.S., but he he um, saw the um, or at least saw the experienced a uh, well, mutilation number one, from one was eight, it was 1897 okay 1897 it was, it was right, during, during the great airship wave when okay uh, these giant dirigible type craft that had these big paddle wheels and super bright lights were seen uh yes in a wave across the united states starting in in california and over the next uh two years they were seen further and further east by the time they got to Yates Center, Kansas, it was a big deal. It was a big story, a national news story. And um, Alexander Hamilton was one of the founders of uh, his county in Kansas. He was the okay. justice of the peace. Uh, it was a well-considered and pillar of the community. And um, he was he heard a commotion one day, and he, he went outside and uh, he noticed his his uh, farmhand and his son was struggling with one of the calves that they had on 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 the farm, and yeah. so he ran out to see what was going on. And he noticed that there was a rope going from the calf's rear all the way up into the air. And then he saw this airship that was slowly going away from the ranch. Well, the cow yeah. had it looked like it had been lassoed and roped and um it had gotten caught up in a barbed wire fence 
and they were trying to get, got stuck. simultaneously get the rope off and get the calf out of the fence before it really hurt itself. And so yeah. they, they, they managed to get the calf freed, but they couldn't get the rope off, and the calf went sailing away underneath this airship. <laughs> and oh. so Hamilton freaked out. Uh, he immediately so went even, into town. What? Even with the calf, so 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 you're saying was the rope still around the calf as it sailed yeah. off, or was it some other force? It was the rope that was pulling it. Oh, yeah, geez. the rope. The rope was was, you know, the calf went dangling underneath this airship, went, you know, flying off. Uh, and um, the next day, the calf was found about two miles away, and um, it had been mutilated. And the only oh. thing that they had left behind was, uh, uh, pretty much, was the hide and and um, and some some of the actual body, but uh, a lot yeah. of the the parts were missing and, and similar um, to the modern day, you know. To, to yeah, to the most well, recent, we don't uh, know. Uh, we, there, oh, there wasn't okay. a real real accurate description of the condition of the animal, at least from what okay. I've seen. And I did really re research this a lot. Uh, along with David Perkins, uh, my you, my research associate, would uh, you agree then? Um, I mean, just just this case alone, without you know, before we get into some of the more more uh, recent cases, that this would give some credibility that at least some uh, of the mutilations, because I know there's been a big theory that some of the mutilations are related to like government testing of anthrax, this or that, but at this sighting alone, because you know, this man seemed like he was a very credible man in his uh, area uh, of Kansas that he was from. He was a huge former military member. He oh, created okay. a huge controversy. Uh, he went in and told everybody that he could, he could find about it. And of course, yeah. everybody was looking at him like he was nuts. And, and there was no pretense up... for for him to have a sighting like this. This is not like he read the papers of the modern day. This is before there was any talk about this going on. Correct? No, no, there, 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 nothing like this has ever been reported yeah. uh, until some recent reports where people claim that they've seen cows going up in beams of light under UFOs and that yeah. sort of thing. And all those stories and even videos that are out there are apocryphal. Yep. I don't I don't buy into any of them. In fact, okay. this particular story was debunked by the esteemed UFO historian Jerome Clark. Um, for many years, this story has been considered a hoax because Jerome Clark said that Alexander Hamilton was a member of a liar's club and that it was all just, you know, a big hoax. Well, I mean, is there I any truth back. to that? Huh? I, I mean, as far as him being a member of a liars club, I've I've never even heard of something like that. Oh, it was a big deal back then. Yeah, there were tons of liars oh, clubs was... all over. Oh, yeah, okay, all right, all right. Thing. Uh, so, what was a liars club? Well, it turns out that uh, Jerome Clark is the liar. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I Fair researched enough. it. I went and checked his sources out and found out that not only was he not ever, I mean, I could find no evidence of him being a member of a liar's club, but he had an affidavit drawn up, signed by the 12 leading pillars of the community, the bankers, the lawyers, the doctors, the, the local uh, law enforcement officials, all signed a document swearing under oath to Hamilton's uh, honesty. And veracity and the fact that they believed him. Uh, so yeah. UFO uh, people, uh, especially in the 70s and 80s, they really had a problem with UFOs in any way, shape or form being linked yeah. to UFOs. So they would bend over backwards to look for ways to make separation. The whole idea of cattle mutilations uh, being perpetrated by Satanists or cultists uh, is all due to Jerry Clark, A. Allen Hynek, J. Allen Hynek, uh, later on uh, Kevin Randall. Um, they're the ones that were touting this particular theory. Uh, and they convinced a BATF agent, Donald Flickinger, they convinced yeah. him to alert all the county sheriffs in the country to the fact that there are cultists mutilating cattle. 
This is all the way back in the in 73. And so a memo was sent out to all the sheriff's departments. And this particular link between cattle mutilations and Satanists has, has been there ever since. Uh, it's the and first we, thing you'll see in, in newspapers. You know, cultists blame for mutilations or... It's kind, of, uh, it's kind of an easy out, right? You know, like it seems like an easy way to explain a yeah. complicated well, it's uh, like, uh, mystery. It's it's like that whole, you know, wave of, of paranoia that happened in the late 70s and early 80s. The, you know, the Satanists are running our kids' schools. And, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's it, Anton LaVey, who started the Church of Satan. Uh the bald guy with the spooky uh, goatee and dressed in black, had a black house, lived in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, he became, because so many people blamed him for cattle mutilations in the seventies, he became an expert on them so that he could convince them that that's his, his people had nothing to do with it. I mean, yeah. he really had to, had to know what he was talking about. And so, uh, I find it just uh, ironic that uh, that UFO believers uh, and promoters are so paranoid about being linked with such a distasteful subject that uh, they'll go to any length to uh, disassociate the two subjects. Yeah, and um, as far and and we know just from other uh ufo research that uh j allen hynek was originally um fronted to um had the what was it uh, project blue book investigations and then it turns that the more that he looked into the ufo matter himself because it was known that that was basically a ruse for the public to explain the ufo situation down downplay it and say hey this could all be explained away by mundane explanations there's nothing to this matter if we really look into the two or three percent of the unexplained we probably could explain them but there's just not enough data available so j allen hynek was the one he was like the poster child for um fronting this uh investigation which ultimately was a roost to the public to downplay the matter so you know if you factor his name into cattle uh mutilations he you know it wouldn't be shocking to think that he would try to downplay a situation like that also and make it seem like uh hey it's just satanist you know it could be explained easily yeah and just let it go away there's nothing the heineken clark promoted two prison inmates named dugan and bankston who um, came forward uh, in, um, I think, late 72, early 73. I'm not sure on the date, but um, they wanted to get preferential treatment and be moved from a really nasty maximum security prison into a minimum or medium security prison with better food, better facilities. And so they came up with the uh, the story that they were part of an occult group that had been doing mutilations and they were willing to turn state's witness uh, in exchange for better treatment. And, yeah. um, and so Heineck and, um, and Clark heard about this and mentioned this to, to Flickinger. And this is how Flickinger, you know, the um, investigator from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, this is how he got involved. And then, um, it turned out that Dugan and Banks and they, they couldn't back up their claims and, and their whole, you know, it was, it was a house of cards that they had built and, and, it, and it collapsed, but not before Flickinger had sent out the memo to all the County yeah. sheriffs. And so you have okay. that, uh, you know, that link of, uh, of Satanists and, 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 you know, the connection to cattle mutilations. Now what's interesting though, is I, I do believe and I don't use that word very often, but I let's say I have a sneak and hunch that there is some aspect of ritual blood sacrifice at the very okay. core of the phenomenon where uh, the highest strange cases lie, and with that that like you said, the the two percent, three percent of cases the, that we can't explain that that are freaky. Uh, the, the actual 
well, some are physically impossible even, uh, yeah. that there is some sort of connection to ritual blood sacrifice there. And, and I think that those super high strange cases are the least likely cases to be reported. And they're also the cases that, um, I don't know, I think that there's a connection between the modern animal mutilation phenomenon and humankind's ancient practice of animal sacrifice. If we sacrifice yeah. the animals that, that, you know, maybe we don't value as much, the gods won't come down and get the good ones. That sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. And, uh, so, so, um, just, just circling back to what we had originally spoke about, if we could go, maybe go into a little bit of detail because for, it seems like, even in, in in the world of uh, UFO investigators, like when I speak to some people, they're just not really up to speed with why these events are so strange. Like, oh, so a, a cow was found dead. Like, what's the big deal? Like, Snippy the horse. Like, oh, so a horse was found dead and I'm mutilated. So, I mean, you know, just from the, if you would say that to somebody who has zero paranormal background investigation or someone who's not a UFO investigator, just the term of saying, well, a horse was found uh, mutilated. So the average person would probably just say, well, all right, so what happened? Did somebody kill yeah, the horse? Yeah, we mutilate a cow every bat? second. We mutilate yeah. a, 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 a head of livestock every second. Yeah, we so like, why is that? Second. So why is Snippy the horse? Like, if you want to just go into some details, cause, because I just have a little bit of, like, strangeness going around Snippy the horse. Like, for example, when Nellie, was it Nellie Lewis touched the horse, her hand got burnt. There was some sort of chemical or something on the horse. Well, it was um, actually she a also, piece of meat that uh, was found near the horse. piece of meat, huh? And, but, uh, like, didn't somebody didn't burn their hand it. or something? Uh, oh, didn't a, even touch it. There, there was a, a mane hair, an obvious horse mane hair. Okay. That stuck to the, 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 she said it looked like a chicken gizzard. And huh. it, was, it, was on a, it was on the branch of a bush. And all she near did was horse. pull the hair off. And her hands yeah. started to develop like an acid burn. Acid uh, burn. Okay. Well, so see, that, but that's something that 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 that's been seen again and again and again no, with these some no, of these animal uh, 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 mutilations. Never. I heard no, not not uh, not the gizzard, but I heard there was other cases of people touching or being near like a animal mutilation, and smelling like a chemical smell, and getting a touching like the 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 animal and then getting a burn on their hand or something or getting feeling like a sting. There was one or two other cases that were in the maybe, uh, maybe one or two, but but the the one you may be referring to is. Uh, uh, Jerry Valerio, who was a land, a, a livestock, uh, you know, brand inspector in New Mexico, he he got called out on a mutilation case, and the animal had been in the hot sun underneath a blue tarp, and when okay. he pulled the tarp off, he got a whiff of this chemical, which, as we we now think, uh, was some sort of uh, delouser. That the animal was sprayed with some sort of insect insecticide, and so, it had it had it had um, somehow uh, become agitated underneath the hot tarp. And when he pulled the tarp off, it, it okay. all he, he got a, a lungful, and it 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 almost killed him. Uh, he so what up, about? Oh well, wow! I didn't know it was that serious. It, yeah. it, did he have to go to the hospital because of it? Oh Obviously, yeah, he was in the hospital for killed. quite a while, and, and he had to retire. Shh because of that jeez uh, all right so i read when the, the it, when your book was going over um snippy which i guess her real name was right what lady the horse but the press picked up on snippy the horse maybe because it had like a more sellable name to the public yeah, more uh, colorful snippy the name. Horse. yeah snippy yeah. sounds like a horse that got mutilated lady yeah does. yeah yeah not yeah not lady the horse so um but whoever first went on the horse, there was there was a witness to the original discovery of the horse who who stated the smell of a chemical or embalming fluid no, near or on it, the it, horse. It, 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 it smelled like a a musky perfume, a medicinal perfume odor, and I have smelled that. I had it on one yeah. other case. So what? So so that's something that has been smelt. You know, not just once. This is something that has been smelt more than than once. So, is that you know possibly the sign of like a some sort of a chemical being used, some, or some sort know? of potentially some sort of disinfectant? Uh, 
again, disinfectant. If you pull up that calf, that Del Norte calf case, uh, yeah, that's the only other me, case uh, that I've had care. where I've smelled it. Okay, so but but you smelled it there. So I mean, you know, the fact that it was smelt more than than, than once could be some sort of. I mean, you well, know, I again, wouldn't be able to, to, to speculate. We can't. We can't. We don't know if that. The guy that smelled snippy was not the guy that smelled the calf. You, okay. You know? Yeah. If we don't have the same witness right. smelling more than one, then you can't <laughs> like, say it's the same smell. We're just saying there was an odd smell. Yeah, so, yeah. and the fact that, that, uh, um, right there, go back. Uh, is this it? No. Nope. Uh, had it. I know I had it. And this is right here. Yeah. yeah th this calf, uh, you know, I'm assuming people out there know what a cattle mutilation is. It's a, uh, Head of livestock that's found dead for no visible reason, no apparent reason. It's generally uh, found missing its reproductive organs that appear to have been surgically removed or excised. Oftentimes, an eye is gone, an ear. Um, if it's a cow, the udder oftentimes is taken. And the, the female cow's reproductive tract is taken out like a plug. The male yep. genitalia of bulls uh, and steers uh, is gone often with a very precise circular cut. Um, a classic mute are the ones that have the jawbone um, exposed and the flesh around the jaw gone. And uh, the tongue is usually, in this instance, taken out surgically from deep within the throat oftentimes along with the lymph system. Um, now, what I've just described are the organs that humans most readily develop cancer in, except for lungs. Lungs, uh, we develop cancer in because of smoking. Cows don't smoke. Um, yeah. This particular animal was unusual in that the right front leg was gone. The animal was actually initially discovered by the rancher in five inches of fresh snow, the, the two or three gallons of blood that would normally be found in this animal, there was not, there was only one drop and it was on the dried up on the left rear hoof. Uh, okay. The brain was gone with no break in the cranium. No break in the cranium. Wow. And the dura, which is the thin film that surrounds the brain um, and between the brain matter and the skull, very fragile. The dura was left perfectly intact inside the brain that case. Is, That's impossible. You cannot do that. But it, but it wow, was there. That is very strange. The animal was missing its uh, rib cage. The lungs were gone. Um, the spine from where it connects to the skull all the way down to where it connects to the hips, the spine was gone. And it was taken out in an upwards breaking motion, which because of the hide there would have been physically impossible to do. The So where was the only hole? It, it, was the, where was the hole for any of this? Was, so the, the, the eye was the missing. Leg, so the where, right front leg was, there was a, a big circular pristine cut where the leg should be. Okay. And then, but it wasn't speculated that the spine was taken through the hole of the leg. It was taken upwards. It was taken upwards because of the the, the way the remaining discs, you know, the 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 first disc on the hip and the first uh, disc below the skull. Yeah, they were broken it like it had been taken in an upwards motion. Okay, um, now, and the only other hole that possibly could have taken was was through the eye. Like what's no? Like how the, is it suspected? The, the that... big, the big gaping hole where the leg was, the front, right front leg. Uh, now, what what is also really interesting is that the two most delectable organs, the heart and the liver, were yeah. surgically excised from the animal, and then they were laid down carefully in a like a display in the body cavity, which is I've never heard of that before. Uh, so they were left in the animal. Yeah. Huh. Um, the but they animal were surgically was, taken was out. kept in a heated garage and did not develop cadaverine, which is the molecule that makes dead meat rot, uh, smell yeah. rotten. Um, it, again, um, I noticed a slight 
whiff of what I could only describe as a medicinal musky perfume or incense. Yeah. And there wasn't very much of the, there weren't many of those types of molecules there, but the ones that were there were extremely strong. Uh, later when I left, I was driving home. This would have been a couple, three hours later. I noticed I yeah. had a little bit of, of straw on my, my, my fleece, uh, you know, jacket. And I, I brushed it off and I, I instantly got a whiff of the, uh, of that perfumey smell. So wow. there weren't many molecules there, but the ones that were there were very, very strong. Um, two were you able UFO to do any testing? What? Were you able to do any testing on, on any of the animals? Yeah, to find this out is what, one of the any, few. There was chemicals. Well, no, I, I didn't. I didn't get any sort of uh, uh, results back uh, uh, chemistry, but um, I did get a, a veterinary pathologist did look at samples, and it was one of three or four cases that he said uh, were definitely interesting to him, and it was one of the huh. only one or two that he said. He could not determine how this animal uh, had been cut on, and yeah, because you know, just just from what you're telling me, the only hole that it was possible to remove the spine through would have been through the leg, like because there's no other large holes in the animal that would have been able. So, in an upwards motion, somehow the spine was cut out and dragged through the hole of the leg, and then it just seems like that would be damn near impossible to do you know well, yeah that's why i consider this my highest strange case out of 200 yeah i i, I investigated yeah, just... uh, in a roughly a 11 year period i investigated um around 200 cases um and let me ask you just j j just as a follow-up so did the whole so the eye was you said the eye was taken out one of the eyes yeah. Now, did that hole that the eye was taken out? Did that was the was the brain cavity sealed? Was the skull sealed? Yeah. Was there any? So there was the salt the 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 skull was sealed. So there was no intrusion of the skull. But well, yeah, except brain for the eye sockets the and the nasal passage, and you know where the skull. Uh, but there's not a have been connected to the spine. But those were holes, but there's not a large hole in, in a, any of those that goes goes immediately, you know, because you have the eye socket, but that doesn't go immediately into the brain. Sure, I mean, it's it a very it's for the most part sealed. So, what I thought was strange, like the strangest part, is what you were telling me out of the 200 uh, mutilations that that you did, was that, you know, there's absolutely no explanation for as far as the. Um, brain not being inside the skull because like you said the eye was yeah. missing yeah but you have a socket in the back of your eye there's a nerve that goes through there but it's small and then the base of the skull that's all sealed so yeah exactly. there's really i like i mean i'm not a doctor or anything like that and i don't have any i used to be a emt but i don't have any extensive training as far as you know you know uh, other than taking anatomy and physiology when i had to, when i had to get my new york state emt license right. um to, to be a b uh, b class emt um but we did have to take anatomy and physiology and we learned about the brain like the the, the like the arteries the parts of the body the the for the most part, the brain cavity is sealed. So in order to gain access to the brain cavity, and we even know when somebody has surgery or if somebody has a head injury that they have to actually sometimes drill a hole in the skull to relieve the pressure. Um, there's no way known to science that could remove a brain out of somebody's skull without actually opening the skull. So you're saying that the brain was no, not inside the no, skull. No, the Egyptians right? could do it. How? They, they took it they through, through the nose. They would put in these hooks through the uh, hooked uh, tools through the nose um, into the ears and pull the brain out piece by piece. Was but there that any? Would totally, that would destroy the dura. Okay. The dura, so the dura was perfectly intact in this animal. So it was per, like perfectly intact. So that perfectly intact means that it would surround the entire brain. Yeah. So the brain was taken out, like almost as if something unknown to science, unknown to technology, some sort well, of and unknown. See, see, the brain is connected to the dura, 
at, huh. at various points. And the fact that the brain was taken out and it didn't pull the door out with it or yeah. tear it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's virtually impossible to do. Yeah. That's so we're why, talking. That's why this is such a, so an strange. Case. Yeah. So we're talking and, and about, so this John, you know, the, the, the guy at the veterinary college, he, he, he said, I don't know what you sent me, but I can't tell you how this thing got cut. This is, yeah. So, so basically this is for our listeners because a lot of people want to throw water on th th these sorts of things real quick and say, well, it could have been this or it could have been that or it could have been predators and it could have been. We're talking about a situation right here. There is well, no we'll go, explanation. Go to the, uh, the one with the animal in, in the tree. Oh, that was the uh, javelina, right? Right, the, right. Yeah, there it is. Now, there are no javelinas in, anywhere in Colorado. Yeah. The, the, the nearest javelinas are 400 miles away. It's not a natural uh, animal to the area. It's not no, like it's, no, it's not, not a grazing they, territory. They don't, they don't live here. And well, they certainly they, they don't climb trees. <laughs> and they don't climb trees. Yeah. And uh, this was found up quite quite up in the branches, tied up in a tree. And uh, as you could just see from the picture, if we kind of, you know, if we just look at like this area right here, that looks like its uh, jaw is exposed, right? Yeah. Is that what we're seeing? Yeah, it was it was in a mutilated condition. Yeah. So the bone of the jaw is exposed. So as far as the mutilation goes, these animals are bloodless. Uh, a lot of times the section of their jaw is exposed. And this is, um, it is absolutely unknown to, to medical science, like how like this could be done. And especially that animal with the calf, there's, there's no way to explain that. And how no. do you take the, without disturbing the membrane that surrounds the brain, how do you remove the brain? And if you, if you could do it, there'd be a <laughs> whole lot of damage and disruption in yeah. the process. This is just uh, some sort of technology that's unknown to, to mankind. And yeah. this is one of those cases of why we call it high strangeness because. Well, and, and, and yeah, again, uh, out of 200 cases, 160 of these cases were like, eh, maybe yeah. it's weird. Maybe it's not. Yeah, just like yep. UFO sightings, you know, like you just 85 percent, 90 percent are going to be equivocal. And yeah. then out of the 40 that were left, those 40 were cut by some yeah. sort of cutting instrument, whether in three or four cases, I, I think, or two or three cases, it was high heat, uh, which a lasing uh, tool. And the other cases were all with a, a sharp cutting implement, like a scalpel or a yeah. super sharp knife. Um, out of okay. those 40, eight of them were high strange. The calf and was then, the, the, the most high strange. And then moving forward uh, again, let's just kind of get into some of the strange activity that surrounded these uh, mutilations. We had, um, I know just taken from my notes we had sightings of these black helicopters. We had strange lights. You know, there was one case you talked about in your book. There was a wave of these black unmarked helicopters being associated uh, somewhere near or around the sites of the mutilations. And in one case in Logan County, Colorado, there was actually a coordinated chase with 17 ground units yeah, in, uh, on yeah. August 21st, 1975. Uh -huh. And they actually rented a, a plane to chase this helicopter. And this thing was dodging them, turning off his lights. I mean, we have an in-air chase. Yeah, of and a they're helicopter. not all black either. Um, okay, none of them know, are black. Not not all of them are black. Red, white, and blue, blue. Okay, so different drab, types of helicopters. Gray. So it looks like- I was you know, recorded I, as a black helicopter. When I, uh, a friend of mine uh, rented a helicopter and flew down for me to take a flight flight around the San Luis Valley and, and videotape. Yeah. And um, it was one of those ones that has a tall uh, pylon that goes up to the rotor. I've, it's a, it's okay. a particular brand of helicopter, two-seater. It was dark purple in color. And um, it... Um, by the time we we got we were done flying around um you know uh, he was about ready he had to get back because because we had already used up two tank fulls of gas and so yeah. he he had he had to get back so we could get get more fuel 
And I had run out of batteries, so I couldn't videotape anymore. So, you know, I've been looking out the side of my window pretty much the whole time. And I turned and looked at him. And he was sitting there with his eyes half closed, his hands behind his head. And the stick he had between his knees and was, you know, piloting the helicopter with his knees. And I looked at him and I said, you know, everybody says helicopters are really difficult to fly. It doesn't look too hard to me. He goes, oh, it's yeah. not. And he let go of the stick with his knees and the helicopter started fluttering around. He goes, give it a try. So I grabbed the stick. He said, keep your feet off the, the pedals, off the rudders. Yeah. Um, but he let me start to fly it. And so we were headed back to Crestone. We had about a 40-minute yeah. or a 40-mile uh, jog to get back to where we had taken off from. And um, so, you know, I'm kind of diving and weaving. And, you know, he said, don't go too close to the ground, but you can go down a little further if you want. And I saw I saw a herd of cows. So yeah. I said, hey, let's go check out the cows. And so wow. I went down and I kind of buzzed down and circled around and buzzed down again. And and then, um, you know, went back to Crestone. The next day. How the cows react? I, to, they reacted. They were like running away, running and, away. Uh, yeah. So, like, just, 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 just to be clear with people, that's a just a little anecdotal information that it, it wouldn't be so easy if you were like in a black helicopter and you had to actually capture one of these cows. You can imagine how not not during the daytime. At night, it would be much easier. Um, yeah. But but anyway, so we get back the next day. Somebody calls me up and goes, "Oh man, you won't believe it." Let me bring this over. And so he brings over an article in the Rocky Mountain News and it says, Mystery Helicopter Menaces San Luis Valley Herd. <laughs> oh, okay. So you actually got the in there. The reported mystery. me as a black helicopter. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Because it's, 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 you know, there is legitimate black helicopters that do come through there and they do not want to be identified, be it no. some sort of monitoring program, you well, know, some... And, the sheriff and a deputy chased me, and they tried to try to keep up with the helicopter. Oh wow! Because I wasn't using the roads; I was going straight there like a bird, you know. Yeah. And there was and that's what away trying to follow me. And and just to kind of go back over, that's what makes this super strange. Again, is that we have these situations where you find the calf, and it's unexplainable by science. And then you also have these situations where black these black helicopters, be it. We don't know, like a possibly a special access program, unknown government program, quasi military type program, but it's not uh, some sort of uh, obviously technology that the military would have, but not identifying themselves to any or anybody in the public as somebody being associated with the military doing some sort of operation around these cows. Um, so and that adds to the strangeness so we have and and this is not just like one off this is like again and again and again we have multiple accounts of of these sorts of helicopters and i, I read in another account uh, in pueblo county um an officer shot his 30 30 rifle at one of the helicopters and it ricocheted off the the helicopter uh, i stated that it looks like was the officer injured in 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 a in on that incident or or was there no injury associated with that cuz i saw one where it said that officer might have been injured and i'm just i'm just kind of trying to double check my notes but it did say an officer fired a 3030 rifle at one of these helicopters yeah down in down in costilla county at the height of uh, in the fall of 75 um sheriff ernie sandoval and his deputy pete espinosa and two other deputies responded to a mutilation call and they they saw a helicopter buzz by them super low and so they just started firing at it and they hit wow. it pretty and, good and a 30 and a 30 30 rifle that's not something to uh to to, to laugh at that's a no that that's would be a serious piece of hardware and yeah yeah they they it started the chopper started making clanking noises and Smoke started coming out of it, and they, they thought that they had shot it down. But wow. It was never found. Uh, and Sandoval said in the interview I did with him, he says, well, you know, we almost brought her down, but uh, uh, he probably got in trouble when he got back to Fort Carson. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so if they know where these helicopters are coming from, this could be some sort of like a quasi-military type of operation. And the some fact the that cases, they never, yeah, not all, they never heard a word about it because you know if that was a civilian or something like that, and they go back and they land, they say, "Oh my God, you 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 had this uh, sheriff shooting his gun at me." I don't know why, you know, like that that would have been potentially like uh, a national news. They would have been all over the press and trying to sue. But this is an operation. If you're getting shot at by a rifle that could clearly pierce through the skin of a helicopter and kill you and you still want to keep it quiet this means you were out and about doing something that was either secret or top secret this is something that you didn't want to be known you were doing because even after almost you could clearly state an attempt on your life was made you're still going to keep your mouth shut because whatever whatever reason or business you were conducting supersedes the fact that somebody attempted to uh, take take your life so the secrecy of this project or whatever business that this uh, helicopter operator was conducting was more important than the fact that he was getting shot at to, to somebody at yeah. some level because this was never it's not like anybody approached this officer after and said hey you know we got some word you were shooting at our guys no we were doing no. some sort of monitor nothing like that so this no. this, this kind of adds again if you think about the seriousness of what's going on here it's uh you know somebody with some access to some considerable uh, amount of money and resources that they're able to you know y- use these helicopters and um and there was even I'll I'll circle back around to it but I know there was um a case where right here with uh Gabe Valdez who was uh Emmanuel Gomez who was a rancher Gabe Valdez who was a New Mexican state trooper um they were or Gabe Valdez became almost like a on the law enforcement side kind of like how you said you became the the mutilation guy as a state trooper Gabe Valdez became a mutilation guy also where he was called to a lot of these in New Mexico these sites and you know, there was an instance where they found a gas mask next to one of the mutilated cows with some radar chaff, almost like somebody was trying to use radar chaff and it malfunctioned and it, it was either stuffed in the cow's mouth or left purposely on scene, which adds another layer of mystery to say, are right. are are these individuals purposely leaving items on the scene? There was one where a cow's tongue was found in a bag near the scene. And it's like, were these being left on purpose? to throw the investigators off a trail because now to say you know if if you throw too much stuff out there you're confusing who's ever investigating what they're investigating you know if you get like these red herrings like oh we thought we we started to get an idea about what was going on until we found the gas mask with the radar chaff now there's this whole new level of like what is going on here and you know uh it turns out that on july 5th 1978 um the uh, three of those gentlemen, or actually those two gentlemen, Emmanuel Gomez, Gabe Valdez, and Howard Burgess, they, Gabe Valdez came up with the idea that, like, why are certain types of cows being used? Why are they being used repeatedly in, in, in these mutilations? There is a pattern here. And, you know, if you're in, you're in law enforcement, you start to scratch your head and you say, what is that pattern? And um, he thought maybe these cows are being marked or they're being like, how are they being selected? And how are they being found in the middle of the night on top of that? If they're being picked beforehand, because there's a pattern to how these cows are being picked. And then there, there would just be too much confusion to fly in the middle of the night and start figuring out like this certain type of cow to be selecting. So he did an experiment where they found out when they ran these cows that were um, cows, I think of Manuel Gomez through a shoot and they put a, uh, a like an ultraviolet light. They found out these cows were being splashed. The types of cows that were being abducted, then mutilated, were being splashed with a type of phosphorescent paint that was only visible through or under a um, like a black light. You know, so if anyone's familiar with a black light, sometimes uh, markings and things that aren't normally visible will. Um, will uh, pop up, you know what I'm saying? Like you'll see stuff that you normally won't see, like a blood or like luminol. There's something that law enforcement uses. It's called luminol. And when it touches blood um, and then you use a black light over it, you know, any area that might have had any DNA or blood will, will, will you know, will, will spark up like a Christmas tree almost. It's like super bright. And um, they were finding that um, some of these cows were being marked. And then after about three or four weeks, the paint kind of just lost its phosphorescence. So, and, and, Again, a, another layer of mystery. Is this the only time that that, that you've heard of something like this, that they yeah. found out the cows were being marked or any other yeah. animal across the world? 
Yeah, I, I checked uh, as soon as I found out about that particular uh, event, or pretty early on, 94, 95, I think I got a black light, and I would uh, cover the cow up and try to create darkness, and uh, I'd run the yeah. thing you know, over the body. Those are the times that I disliked the most because I didn't like being, number one, being so close to the dead body. And number yeah. two, I didn't like being under a coat <laughs> in yeah. close proximity. Uh, There's a, a few times where I had to burn my clothes. and Wow. And, uh, you know, my girlfriend wouldn't let me in the house. She made me take a cold shower with the garden hose. And, yeah. Uh, it, it, it was not not fun. Some of it. It's wow. my least favorite thing to do in the world is investigate a dead cow. Yeah, you've made a lot of uh, uh, sacrifices to get to the bottom of a very, you know, and, uh, you know, I think if or when this mystery is actually solved, I think, you know, there's we're, we're going to find out a, a lot of interesting things and probably a lot of very important things about work that's been going on and experiments that have been going on, you know, regardless of if there's multiple perpetrators from multiple different angles, because that's almost how it sounds. There's just so much, so many different angles you, you can come from, from, from this. Um, there was even a lot of blowback. Uh, we had K uh, Kenneth Rommel. Um, who received a grant from the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration for $50,000. And he came up with a, a report. And it basically, again, publicly, it's almost like this was he's an ex-FBI guy. And there is some almost hand in the world of intelligence that somebody was trying to pour some water on this. Because clearly the stuff that you're telling me is not just mundane explanations, but for somehow yeah, in, well, in, 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 in Kenneth Rommel, um, first of all, the quick background of uh, Eloy Martinez, the um, uh, chief investigator for the Santa Fe district uh, DA's office. He, he put together the grant money um, because of ranchers in Rio Rebus and Sandoval and other Northern uh, New Mexico counties. We're losing livestock left and right. And um, so they petitioned the, the state to do something about it. And Martinez went ahead and uh, and got uh, the FBI to lend them. Uh, he, he was retired FBI. He was actually a, a bank robbery expert. Uh, it didn't make any sense uh, to me that they would select him to look into mutilated cows. But uh, yeah, they... Um, they spent about six months uh, in the first part of 1980 going to every dead cow they could find. And what they didn't know was the mutilations had moved out of New Mexico and Southern Colorado and had gone, I mean, hot and heavy in Saskatchewan, Alberta, uh, parts of British Columbia. And they were getting just nailed up there. And, there really weren't any cases happening over that first six months of, of uh, the year 1980. And uh, Rama went out on a couple and was so grossed out that he wouldn't approach one again. He let his underlings, his assistants do all the work. And, and so he really didn't investigate hundred yeah. cases or whatever he claimed. Uh, yeah. His uh, poor, lieutenants did <laughs> and so when he turned in his results well first of all he told david perkins tom adams some investigators at the time before he even went out on a single one he said we all know this is a bunch of bull pun intended and we um, already made it yeah he already made his mind up before yeah, yeah. He, which is which is a major 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 no like a flaw of scientific well, research frank condon did the same thing uh the, the guy did the condon report yeah uh, for ufos and uh and ended up closing down project blue book he did the yep. same thing he, he claimed that oh we figured this out before we even started <laughs> um yeah. so Anyway, it's it's really pro it's, pro it's highly probable that he was going around just looking at those you know mundane cases that I talked about out of the 200, 160 or 
are uh, mundane. You know, you, you really don't know if it's high strange or not. There's not enough, yeah. not enough uh, evidence to support one or the other. And so if he's complaining about smelly cows, he's obviously going out on old cases. Yeah. Uh, you, you need to be there within a, you know, especially during the uh, summer months, you need to be there quickly within 24 hours. Yeah, because then tissues start breaking quick. down and, and it, okay. it, it just, you, it, you really can't do anything uh, diagnostic at, at that point. Yeah. And so, but, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, just to, just, just to kind of go back to uh, with, with Rommel, didn't he come up with that? What was it? 1980? He came up with Operation Animal Mutilation Report. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Exactly. And, and, and so, so, so as far as like he had, he had his, his underlings come out and do this investigation. So really at the end of the day, he's not himself really briefed with what's going on or doesn't sound like he cares. Well, even if he did, the guy isn't trained in veterinary pathology. (laughs) You know? Yeah. You don't get a bank robber expert to come out and tell you what's killing cows. Uh, Yeah. This doesn't make sense. Uh, It's it's like a lot of things that the government does. It it just doesn't make sense. So you're saying it, it... and it was similar to like the whole Blue Book project investigation. This almost seems like it was like just to explain this whole thing away. They weren't really interested in really right. trying well, to come. Right. Well, you know, it's conclusion. it's like oh, at least at least the uh, the constituents in in that particular district are are being served, and 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 uh, and it, you know at least they're going through the motions of of looking like they're trying to get to the bottom of something that they really don't even think is a problem to begin with. So. Yeah. Um, you know, and these things did bounce around a lot. I mean, when you look at the at, at stalking the herd, uh the book, I, I show I do a day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year breakdown of where yeah. the mutilations happened. And they yeah. bounce all over. Um go back right there. Well, this one right here? Yeah. Yeah, okay. there's a map of now these aren't mutilation cases; these are regions where mutilations happen. In other words, each M represents multiple cases. Okay, so that 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 that's good to be clear on that. So just to give you an idea of how many of these mutilations actually there are happen, areas of high incidence. Okay. If you look you... down the two there in, um, in Colorado at the very bottom, uh, right? Th- no, you're. In Utah, right, Colorado, right in there, yeah. yeah. That's this the area. San Luis Valley cases, right there. Okay. Now you see yeah, in the valley, you see two M's. Those two yeah. M's represent about right 139 there. cases. Wow! So, so that just gives you that. Yeah. That just gives you an idea. The, the, I think I read two, a statistic. The two M's just just below there, just in northern New Mexico. Right there. Those yeah. represent almost 150 cases. Wow. So this is a large, large amount of uh, mutilations. Yeah. And in your book, I think it was cited with something like between the 70s and the 80s, weren't there something like 1,700 real cases? like Or the ones that you thought were like le- legitimate, like high strangest type yeah, of mutilation th- cases? That, that's a high strange case number. Um, we're up in the tens of thousands of, of reports. That is... You know, you would think, right? Because it it certainly seems like the the more and more I read your book, there are certainly is law enforcement concerned. There's certainly people that are concerned, and clearly we have from the case where the police officers are shooting at the helicopters. There's some massive type of operation going on here, and in, in one of the cases, you even stated that you you there was um, some fluid taken from one of the cows and chlor uh, chlor. Prosamine was found, which is a widely distributed uh, animal uh, uh, tranquilizer and clotting agent, and, and another yeah. clotting agent. Can you still These hear me? Some of the, yeah, I could still hear you. Yeah, I don't know why my camera went off, but oh, let me take a look if you're still there. Yeah, I see your camera went off again. Hmm. Um, I could just keep it on the screen share. You know, That's I could fine. still hear you though. Yep. So we'll just keep mind. it on the screen share, and um, I'm doing the. We'll just keep the, the the screen shares for the rest of the interview if we can, as opposed to stopping and trying to figure out. I don't know why the camera yeah. keeps shutting off, but we'll just leave it on the screen share then. Yeah, no so, problem. 
and I'll just bounce around. I, I mean, I have enough pictures because uh, um, our original concern was that we, I just had so many, like we weren't even going to get to go over all of them. So I can just kind of just jump around and just keep, keep different photos up and what we're talking about. Um, yeah, but it, it just, just looking at this picture, like from what you're telling me, just so many of these cases. And the, the concern is that like, if we, if I drew a like square around this area, and you're talking each one of these M's in these two M's right here, 139 alone, we're talking t tens and hundreds of cases. Like this certainly seems like ground zero, like this area right here. And there's, you know, yeah. you, you, you yeah, don't have to you be put a. Put up the other map. Let's see. The color Let's map. Go. Right there. That is a map of above ground radiation from a hundred nuclear tests in the Nevada test site. Okay. And if, if you see how the, if you can overlay this map on the other map and see that there seems to be a correlation between okay. where, where we utilize uranium. Uh, uranium. Okay. If you go so downwind be... and downstream yep. from these areas, uh, you'll find that uh, the areas of high incidence of the cattle mutilations correspond. And there's, there's We're a looking definite, at the this, definite this correspondence. Area. Yeah. So you're saying downwind would be like what, like this area right here? Well, like all those that areas. Be, yeah. That, and then uh, and, we go and back to our other map see, here. You don't see how the, um, how the, the cases right go up into Canada either there. Um, yeah. And, and they do from, from your book. I ton, heard you ton, had multiple cases, cases up in Canada. Yeah. In so quite a number of like, Mexico, but we just we just have no idea how many. Because and other than, uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, okay, I was going to say other than other than knowing that there's uh, like a uh, uh, nuclear um, testing or, or or nuclear sites going on. Is there any other speculation why this why specifically this area right here in 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 uh the, the san luis valley would be is there any other nuclear uh military base or nuclear base or any oh, yeah, other speculation yeah, there's tons of facilities all over uh yeah i know i know there, under, there, there was ground facilities there's above ground facilities okay so there's a lot of uh, there's, secret there's, military activity well yeah there's a lot of uh bases with uh abm anti-ballistic missiles of course yeah. remember, this is the 70s um, there were there were also um, areas where we were enriching uranium, um, creating okay. weapons grade munitions, uh, you know, just straight uranium mining, and, okay. we, yeah. and mills that were processing uh, the the ore. Yeah. Uh, anywhere you have that type of activity in, in nuclear power plants, if you go downwind and downstream, that that's where you find your areas of high incidence of cattle mutilations and so there's, and UFO sightings. Yeah. Uh, so mostly. Huh. So, <laughs> so there certainly could be some testing of these animals to, you know, that's a possibility at least. And then, you know, still unknown when we get into these like really high strange cases where the brains of these animals are missing without any known current ways of science to be able to do something like that, you know? And then we have, uh, I know in that area too, there's, um, Dave Valdez did his, um, I don't even know if I have a screenshot. That That's Dave right Valdez. There. there was the uh, purported um, uh, Dulce base, which, you know, there's a lot of speculation on what could be or couldn't be going on out there. But, you know, it, it, it all ranges from, um, uh, it could be like a government f uh, facility out there, I think up at the Arch Leta Mesa, or some people say some sort of a joint alien um government uh, facility but there's a lot of speculation about what goes on out there or what could go on out there if if anything so i know you know uh, his son greg wrote this book based on all his years of investigation and you know from the gas mask to style of gas mask they they found out there and just a lot of um strange activity that's unexplainable you know, has, has anything on your investigation on your end come up on, on anything of that, you know, anything about the p possible Dulce base or whatever other bases or underground facilities could be going on out there. There's just, a, it sounds like you're saying there, there is an increase oh, of yeah, that in that area. Okay. Yeah. There's a number of facilities uh, supposedly along the border between Colorado okay. and New Mexico there. Um, 
the only time I really ran into problems with people um, where I, you know, ended up missing photographs, a map, um, had, you know, strange apparent surveillance of, of my, my whereabouts and activities. Um, most of that happened during the time period when I was looking into um, underground facilities in the area. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's a that's an interesting note right there. When you start questioning about things that are top secret, yeah. all of a sudden people believe it or not, want to start caring. The aliens don't bother me; it's the people. Yeah, yeah that that doesn't uh, surprise me. That seems like for all the paranormal research, with all the strangeness you come across, it's the the biggest problems seem to be caused by people. And you know, it's either how they're covering stuff up or they're intimidating other people. That seems to be. You know, I did a whole investigation on Roswell. I don't want to get too sidetracked but you know it was the it wasn't the you know if there was aliens out there it wasn't them that were causing the problems the death threats and uh and the stuff that was going on were being were being done by the people you know the sheriff of the local area and like a lot of that people a lot of people were getting death threats put on them and it it certainly wasn't coming from the aliens <laughs> so yeah a lot of times to suppress the information there's a lot that's done um have you ever had any incidents to you of you know because you know, you seem like the government, at least, or some entity, some uh, quasi-government or some uh, affiliation of that was interested when you started talking about these sort of facilities going on out there. Because we do, because again, because we did see if there was some sort of a connection and why, if you look at, let me pull your map up again, that area. Um, have you ever had anybody approach you like a whistleblower or anybody that you might consider a whistleblower talk about anything that's been oh, going yeah. on to you because, and, yeah. and, and was there anything of note to say, like, uh, of the strangeness that what some of these whistleblowers might've been? Yeah, absolutely. I had a, a guy that was a, a member of a militia group and they were uh, monitoring that they, they had stumbled on or somehow found out the location of an entrance to an underground facility and they okay. were they were they were surveilling it and, and taking notes and keeping track of comings and goings and um, yep. according to my source they they put together a package for the um, for the state of Colorado and uh, which was immediately forwarded on to Washington Washington yeah. sent what I assume was an FBI agent out, and um, he talked to the uh, militia group and then went out to where they told him to look and disappeared. Well, a short time later, um, they were visited by, like, men in black types who said, yep. we know everything about your, you know, your activities. Uh, we've taken care of the guy that they sent out to investigate this. Here's the location of the well we threw him down, and here's pictures of him before we threw him down there. Oh my if, God! If you guys want to end up like that, keep 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 at it. <laughs> wow! And, and he was getting ready to move away with his family, and a friend of his convinced him to to call me up and talk to me before he left. And so then, the person that. Oh my God! So the person they did say they literally sent him pictures of someone that they claimed they assassinated. Yeah, and showed him. Now, and, and this person, who, this person who that was assassinated, maybe, maybe that guy, maybe they staged the 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 pictures. Yeah, staged the event and just did that to scare away uh, the militia group. Oh, so they claimed that the guy that they threw down the well was through like some other entity that came out there to investigate their what like their ongoing well he didn't know uh, specifically but but i got the impression fbi fbi oh my god so they, yeah so that seems and did did he further state to you what 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 the entrance was or where it was like what this facility was or where it was located i was going to meet him and he was going to turn over all his his maps and physical material but he never showed he didn't even start. He didn't even start to get into it with you, like so. To, like we cannot. I, I had say a couple was, hour phone call with him. That was the only Dulce contact. Bay or, or yeah, we. I can't say if it was the Dulce base or some other base. We don't even know. No, it was in the it valley. In, in the valley. Okay, Dulce so it could have been about forty-five miles west or east of, uh, um, west of the San Luis Valley. 
Okay, so it was in the valley. This this yeah. base, it wasn't. So so that wouldn't have been dulcet. According, but there could have been some other guy. Yeah, he wasn't talking okay. about uh, about Art Salado. Okay, gotcha. And as a follow up, have you ever read the book UFO Highway by Anthony Sanchez? Total bunk. Total bunk. Okay. Where, uh, and what what leads you to to believe that? Because um, I know because I what, looked into in, his background. And um, me and a couple of other um, researchers smelled a dead fish when the whole thing was uh, promoted. And we found okay. out that um, uh, the DD-214 uh, didn't exist. Uh, that the guy yeah. claimed he came forward with a DD-214 and it was forged. Yeah, and, yeah. I was looking. I thought that was interesting because the author of that book claims that he f he filed for that directly from the government. He didn't have the whistleblower touch that piece of paper. He actually got that directly from you know whatever government office that's, would that's issue the DD two fourteen. Oh, that's not. No. You've, okay. No, uh, Mr. Sanchez, go listen to the episode right when the book came out on the Paracast that I hosted where we just totally debunked his ass and he ended okay. up quitting the field a couple of days later and in, in embarrassment. Okay. So of course he came back because you, I mean, everybody has a multiple lives in, in the UFO field. They just yeah. duck their heads down for a few months and then here they are. Okay. They have no shame. Oh. It's, um, yeah, like I said, it's hard, to, you know, like when you hear like that was like a one off because I read the book and I, I spoke about another one of my podcasts. It's hard to uh, corroborate something like that when it's especially one off, you know, because not like we have multiple uh, uh, whistleblowers coming forward. I mean, we had that guy in the 90s, which a lot of people have claimed he'd been he's been de debunked also. But it's just hard to corroborate these like one-off type of claims when a guy like phil schneider comes forward and starts talking about you know alien shootouts and like it, you know it's it's stuff that i think a lot of people want to believe because it's so fantastical but then when it comes to time to prove it and you have to actually like get some sort of document or yeah, some sort good, of way to a corroborate a story to saucers uh, spooks and kooks yeah because it seems like rightly It seems like the uh, like the field definitely draws a certain element of that, and it's hard to keep valid research, and it's hard to not get drawn into certain aspects of the like crazier side or what seems like the crazier side that research is. Especially when you start thinking like, oh, well, there has to be a way to explain this. You know, this is so strange. There's got to be, and then somebody comes forward, and you know, I know even within the world of um, UFO research, I forget what the guys. Corey Good, there's been a lot of controversy around him, and it's just I don't want to get too far into what he, what he's stating, but I've seen interviews of this guy, and he claims he's some liaison for a alien race called the Blue Avians, and somehow he was um, a, a secret uh, liaison on Mars, and they had him stationed there for years, and the Blue, a you know, like it was this really involved story, and he's like this one-off type of case where it's. You have their people like David Wilcock that are putting their stamp of approval on him. And then you got guys like Richard Dolan, which are like absolute bunk, you know? So the people who are involved in the UFO world, like everybody wants to believe something fantastical is going on, but when it comes time to actually prove it, it's just, you know, especially when you have these like one-off type of stories, it's just incredibly hard to prove when the burden of proof is going to be so strong for the really strange stuff, you know, like to have documentation to have, you know, so it's, well, Carl Sagan said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, I, I, I disagree. Extraordinary claims require at least something, some evidence. <laughs> yeah. And like, for example, in the case of when, when you tried to look into this guy, the uh, Anthony Sanchez was a boy with a DD-214, what, it just didn't exist? Is there a way for civilians to look up somebody else's DD-214? Oh, yeah. Or is that You go or to is St. That Louis to the, to the archives where they keep them. Okay. Which is what Larry and Warren this, did. Yep. And the guy's, uh, it, effectively, this guy's DD-214, no, whatever fact, he had. The people at the um, 
you know, at, at whatever that repository is, they said, you know, find out who this is because he's, we'd like to arrest him <laughs> for creating fraudulent federal documents. Okay. So they're stating that that document didn't, doesn't exist in their archive. So therefore, whatever document they see there is a fraudulent, is fraudulent. Um, and okay, so moving forward, there's David Perkins, who stated the U.S. Army's opinion cannon training area. There were some very sensitive exotic activities going on there. Do you, do you know anything further about that? Well, um, yeah, it's in the Comanche grasslands. Um, it's out on the front front range of of Colorado, and it's used by Fort Carson by in the uh, what's that, I think the seventh what is it the seventh mounted Army Division I, f- I forget which which uh, Army group is out there but there's a gunnery range there's a bunch of stuff um, that they do out there maneuvers and training and it's also you know ground zero for cattle mutilation uh mystery uh all the way up the front range um from around los alamos all the way up to around um you know the platte rivers up there uh in well county that whole front range area had probably had hundreds of cases hundreds and hundreds um and the pinon canyon area just a lot of you know unexplained kind of spooky uh military and and um high-tech um, activity lots of low-level flight activity um uh, and um a lot of freaked out cows <laughs> yeah yeah so there was a there, there was another situation um that maybe somebody may have gotten close to what some of this activity might be in 1993 um, there was the refueling of some unmarked helicopters in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, and uh, in Alabama, a FAA investigator looked into the um, Maxwell Air Force Base in southern Alabama, and he was told to immediately drop it and never to speak about it again. Yeah, yeah. Ted Olafant uh, the- was um, in Fife, Alabama. He was um, a policeman there, and he did quite a bit of digging into, uh, I think it was about a hundred cases that, that occurred down there. Um, and it was in Northern Alabama. Um, okay. And the, um, the choppers were flying down from, from Fort Campbell. And initially he thought that they were, and he was pretty convinced that they were doing bacteriological weapons warfare experiments. Um, okay. Which is pretty mean to do that to a guy's livestock. But, yeah. Um, and then it got weirder, and and he um, he developed a, a after talking with me and David Perkins and and um, the other investigators, he came up with a a really intriguing theory that that actually stuck. Um, he wrote a paper called "Mad Cows I Have Known," and equated uh, a possible motivation for the mutilations was to you know, spot check through the, um, the herds of America. Yeah. Uh, for the possibility of, of a breakout of, of mad cow disease or prion disease. Yeah. Yeah. That's and at the time. That's serious. Science didn't know what was causing prion disease. They didn't know about prions. Yeah. It wasn't until ni- 1996 when, um, Dr. Stanley Pusner isolated them and discovered that they were could be considered the the smallest life form ever discovered a thousand times smaller than the next smallest life form which is a virus yeah and um from 86 to 96 uh, there was a huge outbreak of mad cow disease in england if you traveled to england during that time period you were not allowed to give blood Wow. Um, I think if you spent six months there. And uh, because of the terrible out, you know, outbreak, and then right on right on top of it, uh, an outbreak of 
foot and mouth disease or hoof and mouth disease, which is really virulent. Yeah. Um, the British government destroyed every head of livestock in the British Isles, 4.5 million head, and then burnt all the bodies. Well, at the time, I didn't realize that the prions can survive burning <laughs> all the way to yeah. 2,500 to 3,000 degrees. And they, then these misfolded proteins that they call prions, they're, they're, they, you can turn them off, but you can't kill them. So, wow. you know, 20, so it's not even 30 year vegetarians in England are dying of mad cow disease. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Or Kutzfeld Jakob oh, disease, the, the, ver, the version, the variant that, cool. that affects humans. Yeah. So Ted Ted was the first one to publish um, a paper that talked about that, even though I, I think I was the one to put him onto it because I had been studying the British outbreak of yeah. mad cow disease and was thinking, hey, you know, you would think that people here in this country and in South America and Australia especially would be really paranoid that this would happen in their countries and maybe they're testing for it. Yeah. So he kind of stole my thunder a little bit, but I don't care. Um, I, I really liked him. Charlie was a good guy. We lost him about three years ago. Uh, oh, we lost sorry David to hear about Ber that. Perkins three three weeks ago. I'm I'm very sorry to hear about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like these guys contributed a, a lot to the field. Time marches on. Well, David Perkins yeah. was the field as far as I'm concerned. Okay. You know, and as far as um I know PETA was uh, looking into this, they offered twenty one thousand dollars. They stated they would give um if they found out who the perpetrators were for killing cats. Now we had like this, this no, another evolution. Um, there's just, there's just different levels to like what be, it might be associated. We had here, we had the, uh, the, the, the Missouri monster. This was like a, uh, a, a, uh, a um, crypto creature type of creature that was seen. One, one kid saw it with, he claimed with a dead dog under its arm. And then we had, um, what did we have? We had a whole rash of cat, mutilations well these cats there's being been thousands and thousands and thousands of them unexplained just are, are are they drained of their blood also yeah drained of their blood so and they're usually like a, indoor cats that just happen to get out <laughs> what a strange occurrence it's like they're yeah, cut in right half with a giant pair of you know like scissors and and have they ever done any studies on this? If, is it a heat device or is it a, a mechanical no, it's a physical device cutting. that does the snipping? Yeah, it's a physical it's, cut, and they never find the rear cut. end. That is so strange. That is very strange. And then they're they're also drained of blood. And it started in Brentwood in the the you know the hills of of you know L A in the poshy uh, neighborhood of Brentwood in 1970 was the first outbreak. Yeah. Wow, it's just it's just so strange, and there's been nobody come forward, even though every, every major city that. in the West has had an outbreak. Denver, but, Salt Lake City, Albuquerque, wow. Phoenix. Yeah, it almost sounds like just from from what your research, what you're saying, like the people that do kind of you know m might might get close to whatever's going on here, or some sort of like uh, actual truth to why all this strangeness is going on, and then all of a sudden, you know. They they get a, a knock on the door from some guy in a suit telling them to to shut their mouths. Well, so it yeah, seems like yeah, I haven't heard that so, so much. But Linda Howe so, has done a really good job keeping this particular uh, horrible issue alive. Uh, she's done the cats a, or just or the cows. The cats, just, just, just the, the well, whole. Okay. Her whole thing is that aliens are doing all of this, and I I just yeah. beg to differ. I I don't see what the I don't see the evidence for it. You have okay. to be intellectually honest and look at all the evidence. And 95, 93, 95% of the evidence refutes any sort of alien uh, perpetration. Okay. Uh, and uh, you, you can't put blinders on and pretend that that data, that mass of uh, overwhelming data doesn't, doesn't exist. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's the whole idea of intellectual honesty is, in the scientific method is 
is looking at all the evidence, not just the evidence that conforms to your confirmation bias. So just, you know, you, you got to be honest about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, she has done a great and, job on the cat thing. She's really yeah. been on it. Do you, do I, you feel like, you know, just, just recently with people like David Grush coming forward and I know it, like this guy's a, a, been, been another big, uh, controversial figure, uh, uh, Bob Lazar, like a lot of people said he was debunked, he was debunked, he was debunked. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, after the CIA in 2013 came out with the fact that there was an area 51, then, you know, I mean, it's just, just some people associated with like the, the world of UFOs and power. Like he's been one of like a, 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 an amazingly controversial figure. Like everyone's either like, he's the real deal or he's absolute nonsense and there's like you know like two camps of people and then like there there has been some vindication like to say like um there was a security guard that came forward there was some sort of a hand scanner he claimed he was using that area 51 when he would uh get into the security gate it would it would measure the length of your uh, metacarpals and bob lazar was talking about that since the he came out in what like 89 and only recently within the past five years did a former member of security come forward with the picture of the actual booth when you walk into area 51 or when you get scanned in there that you actually use this hand type scanner so like aspects i'm saying aspects of his story have been vindicated over the past 30 years which would lead to some credence that you know there's a possibility that well, what he look, was saying was the truth you have to look at how how the intelligence um agencies operate and how counterintelligence um operates I mean, they may have, have um, identified certain personality traits in the guy that, that conformed uh, to some sort of operation of leaking, um, for whatever reason, leaking information out yeah. of the facility. And it's S4, not Area 51. S4, yes. Um, uh, in, in a way to possibly trap um, any sort of potential... Uh, at the time, Soviet espionage, um, yeah. and, and 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 possibly do some sort of counterintelligence operation, knowing that he was going to spill the beans if he was exposed to certain things, and um, okay. you know maybe they set him up and then gauged his know. response and 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 Just... then used his response to, um, you know, as a counter uh, intelligence tool to burrow in uh, to certain aspects of the UFO community or the expatriate yeah. community from other countries or whatever. So okay. you, you have to look at all the possibilities. You can't possibilities. You can't yeah. take everything at face value. Um, yeah. Do I think Bob, Bob Lazar was out there? Yeah, I think he was. I think he spent some time out there. Um, he's had a very consistent story throughout his whole, you know, the whole last 35 years. Um, he's had a very consistent story. He's not embellished it. He's not, you know, made it into something that it's not. He's not like some of the abductees who every year they remember a little bit more so they can write another book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So that that's usually a red flag uh, embellishing and saying that, hey, yeah. this happened to me 10 years ago. Then all of a sudden, eight years later, you're all of a sudden having like a different spin and a different spin and a different spin. You know, that, that it makes you scratch your head. Like, yeah, all right, the well, why is this world? coming out now? The good, the good writers um, have to come up ways to stay relevant so that they can keep covering their subject. Okay. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. I just thought it was interesting because I, I remember they looked into his Bob Lazar. They looked into his um, his schooling, and they just couldn't find anything. And I'm just like, well, it, it just it just raises so many questions. Like, where did people have the access or the the means to be able to, you know, effectively? if he had records at a certain school get rid of, I mean, cause certainly people who would be involved in high levels of government and secrecy would have access to people that would be able to get things done. You know, if, if, if say, you know, you went to a school or I went to a school and somehow that would be corroborate my claim to somehow say, Hey, we'll find out where this guy went to school, make, see to it that those records are not found. We, we cannot have this guy corroborate a story. It's just, it's just so hard to, cause I know even with this whole, uh, uh cattle, uh, mutilation, there was a couple different stories. One of them was like, um, a teacher, she found some samples. Um, and she got to the point where she took them back to the lab and the lab got broken into and the samples yeah, got rifled through. So she couldn't story. even experiment. 
and then she did it again. So it looks like in September, you know, um, I got a couple more questions for you, but you know, get, getting into the other types of mutilations and that, but just before we wrap that up, I'll, we'll just get into this one in September of 1980 in Northern Colorado, there was a mutilation. Some, <coughs> I'm sorry, some liquid was found next to it. They took samples from the fluid from the cow and brought them to a local high school. Uh, somebody broke in and Iona H uh, Hoppner was the, I guess she was a, a teacher there, like a chemistry teacher or, or a, a teacher at that high school. Yeah. She was going to uh, analyze the samples and um, she had a bachelor's degree in science and uh, her cabinets or wherever she stored these samples got rifled through the next morning. And when she came in, she realized that nobody had been to the school. There, there was no signs of, right? There was no signs of anybody like actually breaking into the school, but yet somehow somebody got access to her lab and rifled through her samples and they were missing. So the next time she said, well, well I'm going to play a joke on who, you know, like not a joke, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to like Trump whoever these people are that are coming in and messing with my samples. And I'll put dummy samples out in, in the area where you would normally find my samples to make it look like I just got new samples and I'm going to hide the real samples in a very sur sur like a surreptitious way where whoever comes in here is not going to find them. Only I know, and I'm not going to tell anybody else. So I'm just like, right. this is my experiment to find out like it, like, am I crazy here? Or is there somebody actually going through my samples? And then the next day, the same thing happened. The, the dummy samples disappeared and she was able to still analyze the um, sample that she had hidden. So, I mean, is there any a thing you want to well, add? In, oh, in, and, uh, in, in the important thing about that story is she claims that the cut, of the sample, she she had sampled a, you know, one of the cuts off off a mutilation case, and she said that the cut was occurring in between the cell walls of the actual sample, which is uh, a really highly unusual uh, observation. Hmm. That, that that she saw that. I mean, is that is that because. I recall her saying uh, something like that would be scientifically impossible for someone to do something like that. Well, you would think with our level of technology, yeah. Um, maybe so, in, in a super high-tech uh, medical lab somewhere, maybe they do have the equipment. Uh, back in 1980, mm, I don't know, you know? Yeah. Even now, that would sound like pretty damn advanced to be able to it, cut it individual to cut, cells. Cut between cell, uh, cell layers, and in, yeah. And in 1980, I mean, you know, we're talking about, you know, 40, uh, uh, three years ago now. It, it would yeah. seem like that, whatever probability that would be now, it would have been exponentially less in 1980. Well, and again, though, you know, you don't see any sort of uh, note of uh, notation of, some other scientists hearing that taking the a sample and getting the same results. Yeah. So, so the fact that she's like this one off that she observed this, but then again, you know, maybe for whatever reason, she just had that careful eye. If she was a, a chemist or, or I don't know what her uh, bachelor's group was in, was it in biology or chemistry. I think she was a, she, a chemical biologist actually. Okay. So, so both. So maybe for whatever reason, she just had that particular eye to catch something like that when in previous cases, maybe for whatever reason. You, you have to have you a know. really good electron microscope. Okay. So uh, normally at a high school, you, I would imagine you would, wouldn't have no, had access to that, especially in 1980. that sophisticated. So the fact that she could have made that sort of um, claim it almost sounds like there's a possibility maybe she was just kind of speculating because the cuts were so clean. It's been so long since I've seen that that case. I'd have to go back and refresh my memory. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. That, like I just thought that was one of the interesting ones, you know? So there was definitely um, – and there was just kind of before we get into maybe some of the other aspects, um, it was saying – oh, there was a – First, uh, the first uh, mutilation, even going back hundreds of years, was in 1606. It's saying, as far as in the in, in the modern age, that was something that your book had mentioned. Also, I mean, yeah. that's quite a bit before. But that was what was was that out in uh, England or was that out in? That was around London. Okay. During the early uh, part of the reign of James the uh, First, 
Macbeth was being uh, rehearsed. Shakespeare was at the Globe Theater. Um, Guy Fox had just been uh, executed a couple months before. Yeah. He tried to blow up the House of Lords. Um, James had just requisitioned the uh, translation of the English Bible or the, the Latin Bible into English. Uh, it was a real key time during during the, uh, the, the you know the reign of of James the uh, first right after Queen Elizabeth had died and um, the only thing that we really know is that there, there were hundreds of these cases that occurred uh, because of the the entry that's in the court records of I think February fifth sixteen oh five. Or 1606, rather, that um, um, sheep, some in some places, a uh, hundred or more, and others less, are being found uh, missing uh, the tallow and some inward parts. And about this, sundry conjectures, but most would agreeeth that it tendeth sure. toward fireworks. <laughs> which wow, which I love that little quote. Very- that's a very poetic way to talk about the. Yeah, in other words, uh, the, the the inward parts part is the part that we you know would. It sounds like a description of a mutilation, if all the yes. meat and in the especially the wool is left behind. Now, yes. tallow um, is an ingredient in the Middle Ages that they would use uh, in the manufacturing of uh, of gunpowder and and um, of, oh, wow. of fireworks. So. I didn't know that, but uh, there's a lot easier ways to go about getting your tallow. Yeah, than, yeah. <laughs> uh, going around, sneaking around, and and uh, mutilating cattle. Back then, they didn't look uh, too kindly on on that, and and the the penalties were quite severe. I mean, when yeah. they when they Guy Fox, <laughs> of course, he was you know he was the, the ringleader of the the gunpowder plot. All the yeah. mass, remember the Occupy movement? They had the mass with the little the little thin pencil mustache and the squinty eyes yes. that that's a, a, a mask of Guy Fox. Okay. Um, that's where that comes from. And he, he almost was able to set off a huge cache of, excuse me, of uh, gunpowder underneath the actual coronation of James I. So they were actually pretty lucky to, to stop it. And of course he was tried yeah. and, and, uh, his execution was uh, quite typical for the time. Yeah. They dangle them, they hang them by their neck until they're almost dead. And then they save them. They stick them on a table and then they cut them open and uh, pull out all their intestines and their uh, inner organs. And then uh, burn them in the, in the body cavity. Now the person is alive during all this, of course. Wow, jeez. Well, first they Something cut, their, like a, cut like their... The end of Braveheart. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what's going on in, in Braveheart. Yeah. And they cut, cut off their sexual organs, etc. And then they... Um, either they cut them up into... They cut the arms and legs off in the head, put the leg, uh, the head uh, on a pike outside of uh, Tower of London, and then they send the limbs to the corners of the realm uh, with a big sign as a warning to the rest of the population not to yeah yeah do Dr- drawn and quartered that's that, that's what they used to, that that was the terminology correct yeah drawn, and, like quartered. drawn and quartered well the other way they used to so, do it is they they hook a horse to each one of your limbs uh, by oh, rope and god then, <laughs> and then, yeah that that sounds absolutely terrible yeah oh. um so getting into that aspect, if we could just uh, other other than crypto creatures, which is one one more quick aspect we can talk about, there was a few cases of human uh, mutilations, and that seems like it was. It's we been, just had a recent like, one. <laughs> oh, yep, you actually had that. You're right. We just yeah, had one. There was a. a fifth, wasn't there a 15 year old girl that was attacked in Peru? It, it, it wasn't this uh, claimed to be somewhat uh, in the same area. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is very unusual. Now, um, debunkers have come forward and said that this is nothing more than uh, piranhas uh, attacking this guy. Well, piranhas wouldn't Why have they stopped eat his whole there. body. 
They would have they would have yeah. cleaned the whole the whole thing. And they would have taken his whole body. There is no evidence of any sort of skin, uh, blood, tendons. That is a pristine, cleaned skull. And that, yeah. that is highly unusual. You it's very difficult. It's almost impossible to do yeah. that. You could take that skull, fresh skull, yep. denuded, and, and boil it in a lye solution on the stove and not get that uh, be able to duplicate that effect. And wow. I looked very carefully, and when they're carrying him, uh, I looked at the neck. I, I was thinking maybe this is a mask or it's not. That's what the guy looked like. That's that's a real picture as far as i'm concerned that is absolutely unbelievable because yeah. the fact that that guy looks like he was just killed there's no bloating there's no discoloration of his body exactly that guy was effectively just killed and, and that's how his he looked like limber. afterwards limber oh so rigor mortis hadn't even well or, it looked like or, rigor mortis or, or had, had, passed. had set in but it had just had passed just started yeah. to you know it had started to go away because he was pliable Wow. And there was also, I, I'm somewhat familiar with this. I, I watched an episode, um, I think it was Jimmy Church's Fade to Black, where he had somebody on and he, the, a guy was actually down there in Peru, someone who was familiar with the area. And um, there was a 15-year-old girl who was attacked. And then uh, she was from like um, a, a certain tribe of people and she had her throat cut. There was a, a slash in her throat and they went out there into the woods and they saw these beings which can only be described as like one of the guys said it was almost like a like a villain from like spider-man like um wearing a green body armor seven feet tall and wearing boots with lights on the back of the boots which allowed these beings to float in the air and they were floating in the air and these uh members of the tribe which got angry with their their this 15 year old girl being attacked shot these beings with rifles and they had body armor that was deflecting the um, bullets from, from what could be described by the witnesses. And this was another body. Wasn't this body found within the area, the same area? My understanding. Yes. Although I, I, I haven't really confirmed a lot of the details of of what's going on down there. Uh, Yeah. I'm hoping, um, a friend of mine uh, who's planning on going down there is going to be able to dig up all the details for me. Okay. Yeah. I'd be very interested to hear more about this one because it sounds like uh, for, for whatever reason, these people had no reason to lie, whatever they were seeing, they were seeing and somebody on the same person also took the video that's been floating around the internet of apparently one of these beings flying uh, up in the area of a tree floating over like a house roof and uh the video floating around the internet, you, you really can't tell what you're looking at. You just hear everybody screaming and you see them pointing with a spotlight towards the air. And they're saying that they're capturing one of these beings on film. It's a kind of like a low grade cell phone video and taken at night, you know, so it's not surprising. It didn't come in that well, but the same person um, that Jimmy church had on said, he took that video and he plugged it into some higher end. Cause I guess, you know, for whatever type of work he does some higher end video editing software. And he like cleaned it up. You know, there was some, special tools that he used to brighten it up to clear the contrast up and he said once he processed that video pretty pretty good uh, you know with, with whatever um uh tools that he used he said he could clearly see the shape of a being that to him at least clearly re- resembled some type of like a alien uh looking type of creature like that we would associate with like a gray alien like that type of face with, with whatever this being was that was floating in the air. So it sounds like, like I said, I, I haven't really researched it too much other than like, kind of like on a, you know, just through, through reading other people's uh, research, but it definitely sounds like a strange case. And then, and, and then they brought the Peruvian Navy in there and they claim they were just in there just to do some testing. Like they just happened to be in the area. Like it's, it was convenient for them to be in the area, just doing training. And like, that's why they came in. Yeah. But it sounds like, it sounds like they came in there because of this situation. It was that serious. Oh, and then <laughs> the funniest part is, I don't know if you heard this one, they explained the whole thing away as miners with jetpacks and body armor miners. And if you've ever actually seen the types of miners that are in the area, it's very like, a very like basic miner, like a man just with like a little satchel and maybe like a pick or something like it's like, you know, like jetpacks alone. If you even it, it follow like where jetpack technology is at, there is a company out there. I actually read a whole book on there. Um, I forget who this guy is. He was a, um, 
Gravi, uh, Graviton. I forget the name of his company, but I, I, I followed him on uh, Instagram. I was looking at his videos for a while, and he actually advanced a jetpack to the point where he has one on one arm, one on the other arm, and then one on his back. So he's able to balance this thing out using these three thrusters. And he, he, he's actually taken this quite, quite a long way. And I think you can get your hands on one of these as long as you take his training course. So you don't want to kill yourself. I think if you have deep enough pockets, I, I was looking into it. I think it's around it seemed to be somewhere in like the three to four hundred thousand dollar mark if you wanted one of these things. So I mean that and and that's very specific technology. They're loud, the thing displaces air, you need both of your hands inside the thing, you know, so to put body armor on, like it, the, the the story just sounds like complete nonsense. So the fact that the the Peruvian Navy went in there and explained this whole thing away as miners with jetpacks. And the people, some people are actually buying this up. It's just, it's just absolutely like laughable. I guess no less laughable than Swamp Gas uh, from J. Allen Hynek, and right. I mean, it's like right. the same type of thing. Well, so, it seems, it uh, seems okay. rather implausible, but yeah, yeah. And and, and this Go is a back. picture right here. Oh, my my very first uh, mute case right there. Wow, very nice. Look at that. And he said that's not a pleasant thing to have to go to. That between, like you said, if you well, wait too long fresh. and the smell. So, oh, this was fresh. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it literally had only been dead. It was probably still warm. Okay. And, and and was there any outcome as far as your investigation on this goes? Like that led you anything yeah, further? Yeah, this, this it... animal uh, had been cut with high heat. Okay. And then, and then you have David Perkins. Okay, and you said unfortunately, you know, sadly, you he, said he we just lost him about three weeks ago. So again, sorry to hear about that. It sounds like you're saying he was the he was the guy that was out there, trying, like looking into this, trying to get this done. So he I'm was sure the you... most knowledgeable person in the field. Okay, I so guess, it seems like now you, I guess, now, yeah. now you would be right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Lin, Linda doesn't count because she only looks at just the small percentage of the data. Okay. And just kind of wrapping this up towards the end here, because we've kind of gotten into, oh, just before we just get out of the, you know, just, just to kick a minute or two, just before we get out of the, uh, the human mutilations, you looked into this and that, that's when I confused that, that, that you might've been a police officer. Cause you said you had ties to a police officer, um, from the early 1980s, um, yeah, Don and Ecker. NCIC, which is the, 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 I remember learning about this. I'm, I'm currently active law enforcement in New York, and I remember when I got my criminal justice degree, we spoke about the the the, the database, the the what was it, the um, NCIC. There was a – I didn't write it down, but I remember in one of my criminal justice classes, we talked about the problem with law enforcement throughout the years has been there's been not one – common database and that's where a lot of things got screwy because if you have to count on different agencies from all across the country all just depending on phone calls and such to be able to, to translate information across there's a huge gap in like time and you know access to information which could be critical in solving a crime so then we had this national fbi database and one of your uh friends who's active law enforcement looked into it and it almost sounds like he was shocked that there was almost like a stonewalling of information yeah. when it comes to these human human type of, of mutilations yeah he said it it took it, he, he he looked into it for three years um yeah this is don ecker he uh went on to um retire and uh because he became disabled and he started ufo magazine along okay. with his wife vicky and he has a show called dark matters which all right, Bell stole before he died and tried to do his own show called Dark Matter. Oh, oh, um, wow, yep, yep. I, I but um, Don Ecker, I remember that is a no nonsense guy. I mean, he's he's like a Philly, you know, cop, and uh, yeah, you know, he he said he did everything. He he did everything that he he knew how to do to get to the bottom of how many cases of human mutilations are out there and. He found evidence that, that there's some, but but absolutely stonewalled. Will not, um, you know, the the most covered up and um, most taboo crime in uh, law enforcement. Yeah, 
So it definitely is strange with the same level of strangeness. And this photograph is up from a famous one in Brazil from a man that was found near a reservoir. Not surprisingly, if you look at the picture that you had showed me and the exposed jaw, the whiteness of the bone, like it's very strange. It's almost at the same strange level that the uh, animal uh, uh, mutilations were taken to. And the last aspect of strangeness was, um, you know, there was one, this was like a one-off type of story. There was uh, somebody who seemed like there might've been some credibility. The guy was, was an ex-Marine in 1992 in uh, Upland, Nebraska. He saw some sort of a football shaped creature sucking the back of a cow. And there was a, a bulb of light or some sort of flash or uh, flying light near this type of creature this might have been some sort of like a cryptid type of creature you know so that's that's what some of the people are throwing off the uh cattle mutilation uh, mystery onto and um I, I don't know if you heard anything past that other than the 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 momo which was the the, the uh, missouri monster that furry type creature that i had a picture of um if there's any more it it, it almost sounds like this is like another type of easy out even though you know if you had some um pattern to like these types of creatures but it sounds like they're 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 very much like one-off type of cases where like you see them and then people want to throw all animal you know or try to say they're associated with uh cattle uh mutilations and it kind of seems like there's not you know you you would know more than me but just from when i was reading your book it seems like these are like cases that you can't really corroborate too much yeah they're 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 like you said they're they seem to be one-offs um uh very very um standalone okay yeah yeah the one with a trucker going down the road and he looks over and he sees uh this big insect looking thing that had these like six or eight legs that were clamped on either side of the cow the thing was you know on the cow's back and it was yeah. had stuck some sort of proboscis or whatever that word is for a snout yeah, was going down into the the back, into the neck, the upper neck of the cow, and he could see it was sucking something out of the cow, and freaked him out so much he became a born again Christian. And uh, that would scare that would scare the hell out of me. Yeah. Also, I'm gonna yeah, I I wouldn't lie to you if I saw something. Yeah, I'm not but, even sure if I'd stop. Even if I was carrying a pistol on me, I'm not sure if I'd stop because God forbid that thing got his suckers onto you know what i'm saying <laughs> like you walked in the middle of something yeah, that, like that. that's like, one what? badass mosquito um yeah, strange strange man well the only like, reason why is... i brought it up was because it was a cow if it had been a some other yeah, animal yeah, i probably wouldn't have bothered but it was a cow you're right but the, and the guy was a was an ex-marine and it sounds like from what you're telling me he he believes he saw what he saw oh, if yeah, he became yeah. a born again christian because of that if something's going to make you change the way that you believe in god I would imagine whatever you saw, you hundred percent believe that you saw it. I mean, yeah, and that's like yeah. something I I, I forgot. Yeah, I didn't even. And read that's that. an important point book. to make. Uh, you know, I I would find out about cases, and the first thing I would do is I I uh, discreetly ask around and investigate the person making the claim before I contacted yeah. them, just to get a good un, you know, unfiltered. I don't know, create an unfiltered dossier on the guy and or the person or the family or whatever and find out from neighbors and people that know them and and do do a good thorough you know, personality investigation on the individual. Um, I found several uh, ranchers, for instance, that uh, appeared to be perpetrating uh, uh, insurance fraud uh, by doing. Oh, wow cases themselves uh to to try to save money on a Look lost investment <laughs> um so Take advantage of a situation like that yeah you don't you don't find investigators out in the field uh doing that very often um there's one popular cattle investigator that um has made a lot of uh, notoriety on a particular case um, in colorado that uh the rancher is, is is known to be a crazy person in his community and is known to uh, has been under suspicion of insurance fraud and and totally took this guy in and, and has just been, you know, getting all this notoriety and and um, publicity 
yeah. when um, he probably shouldn't be getting it. Yeah, it sounds like there's it. It, it opens up. It opens up an area where if somebody is, for whatever reason, doing something they shouldn't be doing, and they want to try to factor in this whole cattle uh, 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 mutilation thing to get um, attention for themselves or or, or or to get money for themselves, it sounds like an area where I mean, since there's such a mystery around it, it's not it's not like you'd be able to prove or disprove it. You know, if they're saying that it's real or not real. So sadly, pe- people would want to could capitalize on something like that. Um, the last one I had was that kind of caught my attention was even though it's somebody tried to relate this back to the cattle uh, mutilations, I think it's absolutely absurd. But I think it's interesting that this could be real right here, um, even though um, – it seems like the well, I just teacher, put it the, in there as, the, as the closest example of something that I've I've seen that could um, that could account for the guy's sighting yeah. of this thing on on the cow's back. I oh yeah, for, yeah, for for, uh, for the cow's back because I heard it, even in the in the strange article it even said this could be some wh- whoever wrote that article. It was um. Journal of Strange News or something. I read the article. I read the bio, the, the the biology teacher's explanation for this animal, and I also read the bottom. And somebody even stated on the Bizarre Journal of the Bizarre that this could be associated with the, the this could be the reason for for a, for, for a, a cattle a mutilation. There was like a comment somewhere in that yeah. page, and like like obviously you know and and, and I know like. You know, it, you know, because if this thing were alive, it would be probably like some sort of a remnant of a, a crawfish. Yeah, and maybe this that thing evolved. is not going to bring down a, a raging two thousand yeah. pound scimitar bull. <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't be possible, e- e- even if it was. And, and and we know from crawfish, just the nature of their 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 mouths and the nature of how they eat. I mean, they probably have like a the claws and probably mostly for defense, but they probably are like bottom feeder type of animals. This isn't an animal that's like picking off large fish and chopping them up with their choppers or they have like small little mouths and they're, you know, like, I, I mean, it's just not an animal capable of really doing that much damage, even if it wanted to, like, even if you, even if you got it angry, the, the most it would be able to do is probably hit you with its little pincers, you know? So, right. but well, I thought this like, was it's like, like down in South America, the, the uh, the debunkers have used the red faced mouse. Yes, the, yes, yes. The most uh, likely culprit culprit to uh, explain the cattle mutilations down in Brazil and Argentina. When, we were talking about that. Yeah, it's uh, the, absolutely laughable. The one case down there that's just blown my mind that that actually did happen because yeah. I've done some research oh. on it was the. The sixty thousand gallon stock tank, you know, the low corrugated tank that they would fill with sixty thousand gallons of water to have out there for the animals to drink, and it was, yeah. you know, about three feet high, uh, four feet high, and huge. And um, rancher goes out and makes sure it's all filled. Goes out the next morning. There's not a drop of water left in the tank, and there's no evidence anywhere of where the water went. And inside huh. the inside the dry tank are nineteen mutilated cattle. <laughs> that is absolutely insane. Yeah, like how do you explain something like that's, that? Like that's how do you? The, that's yeah. that's one of the record uh, case for the record books, boy. Unbelievable. Yeah, that is absolutely like it's just the the strangeness that good, goes good on. Good one in to end the show like on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, Could one, be, that one definitely you know, did happen. And if there was course, aliens, or if there, <laughs> if there were such things as some sort of paranormal explanation for for, for all this going on, and this this picture, uh, honestly, I wanted to post this because this picture seems like it's a real picture. Like this person actually no, it, found it's, it's a real just, thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. Just for those people that 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 want to know what they're looking at here, uh, there was a gentleman hiking uh, off somewhere in the caves of Pennsylvania, and uh, he kind of found his way towards a cave, and he uh, found a chunk of ice with uh, this thing frozen inside of it, and the speculation is that it's some sort of uh, 
uh, remnant of like a crawfish, uh, which kind of evolved maybe like a bullfrog esque type legs, and it has the tail maybe like uh, like like mimicking some sort of like a, a scorpion or something. But it's it's it, it was probably buried under these caves for millions of years, and for whatever reason, uh, uh, one of them got washed up recently. So there's a there's a strong possibility that there's a mating population of these type of crawfish buried in underground streams in Pennsylvania, deep in the mountains, you know, and they just never made their way up to be able to get out of these underground streams trapped inside of rocks. So they just basically evolved to live their yeah, lives down I there. I think it's and, Eyeless you know? too, isn't it? Oh, Eyeless? Oh, okay. Yeah, th- th- they said the eyes were different. If the, if it did have eyes, they were like almost evolved for like dark, like something that would be in complete darkness, you know, and, and the legs, the reason why it would evolve a leg like that is because if you're not in water and the tail curves up, you don't necessarily, you're not swimming because the, sh- the streams are shallow. So you might have to get onto land to jump around or move around at least. So you, it wouldn't benefit you to have only legs that are, are appropriate to swim in water. And uh, just the last thing I want to go over be- be- before we wrap this up, um, back onto the uh, human uh, mutilations, there was a 1956 White Sands missile case of a major Sergeant Jonathan L- Louette. That was a, it was a witnessed abduction. Is this correct? Because I read in another account, some group of people looked into this and they were trying to say that this has been de- debunked because they couldn't find this guy's information. And that's why I'm always kind of like, why I always double question these 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 cases that are like these one-off strange cases or the, or at least these very strange cases and it's like oh well they, they they've been debunked like in the world of the military in the world of the government it's it's kind of hard to it, it's like i've seen it before myself like they've it's easy because they're, these are the people that would have access to the files to the records of these things if something does leak out to say like it, it never happened because if the military didn't want to talk about something like this occurring they could just see to it that the records just find their their, their their way to get lost just like when they looked into to roswell when um senator Sh- uh schiff in 1993 looked into the, the the general accounting's office he was stonewalled and it turned out like when they looked in and when president clinton looked into to, to the roswell files like these files conveniently find themselves not to be where they need to be to be looked at and like so it doesn't shock me like if a document that's why i always question these one-off things where there's apparently some documentation and all of a sudden the documentation yeah, does, and, and doesn't talking, exist and I'm, you're talking about the white sands uh, yeah because someone said this was yeah, this was de- de- debunked, and I'm like, well, uh, they said it was debunked because they looked into well, it. Let's in the put it this way: like, I've never seen conclusive evidence to prove that it happened. Okay, okay. So, like on both ends, then, like, did it happen or didn't it happen? But like, I'm just saying, if it did happen in the military, it wouldn't shock me in the least if they could just say, all right, well, the files that are associated with this just make them not available. They're just not going to be something you you could freedom of uh, of, yeah. of information. This is going to be something that you know just just if it's not something they, they want to talk about because it's somebody that was in the military when it happened, you know, so, yeah, that but they're and stating, the, uh, and the, the infamous bill, uh, French account of the B 52 that was gently laid down in the jungle in Vietnam. And the 12 guys aboard were strapped in their seats, all mutilated. That's never been proven. Either. Okay. So both these cases, yeah. these are cases of people who are in the military being being mutilated while they were in the military. Yeah, now, but now the, both the cases. hunters up in Idaho, that one has some legs, uh, and there's been. Oh, so there was two hunters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, in your book, it just kind of went over that that was a rumor of two hunters, but that's actually has some. There's some speculation that yeah, that's beyond yeah, just there a was rumor. Uh, as as it turns out there. There was, I think, some some one deputy did come forward and say, yeah, this really did happen. Huh. Uh, yeah and you so and uh you were saying that, that the information like beyond that this did happen getting actual facts about it is really difficult yeah the whole thing has been locked up yep yeah, yeah. again like you said it, it just seems to be a, a pattern you know that these mutilations are going beyond the scope of happening just to animals they're happening to people too but which doesn't seem super common from my understanding, from what I read in your book, it seems very uncommon, actually. But when it does happen, as we saw this picture here, it is beyond strange. And I'm sure it's very convenient for the local authorities to just lock it down, cover it up. You don't want mass hysteria. God forbid, you know, some truth came out to be about how, you know, this guy was healthy one minute and then they find him an hour or two later and he looks like this, which is almost physically 
impossible to to do and you know there were association of strange objects of strange beings in the area you know it was an area where we had that case with the 15 year old girl and this just happened in in what in, in uh july this happened yeah mid july, july or something like that yeah yeah so this just happened so we're still well, having actually, this isn't something right that's around like, the time when that weird um las vegas alien uh oh yeah i looked call but I, I actually the same if, if, night as one of the Peru Peru uh, events. Yes, yes. So, so that must have been because that happened on May first, and it wasn't reported until June first. I actually looked into that quite a bit. I spent about a half hour to forty five minutes going over the police report, the police records, and just giving like a play by play rundown of, of that. If you if you listen to my first episode of my podcast, uh, I talk about the Varchina case, and I talk about the the the, the I was calling them the Vegas humanoids, but that seemed like you know it wasn't one hundred percent proven, but it certainly wasn't disproven. And I watched everything i watched the body cameras and i watched the other corroborating information and uh and it seems like there 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 certainly might have been some legs to that story also but unfortunately on the side of that vegas story and you can understand why because the gentleman came forward and the second you come forward with an account like this you all of a sudden you become at the behest of all the debunkers, all the people that want to say you're the problem, that you're, it's, it's a lot of negative attention also. So there's a reason why people don't want to talk about these things, why the, the biology teacher who found this strange cryptid, uh, no, I'm sorry, she didn't find it, who was brought this strange cryptid by a student that used to be hers in Pennsylvania, um, she didn't want to put her name forward with this account. She seemed like she wanted to be very anonymous and it's not uncommon to s understand why because she comes forward and she puts her name behind this. And then for whatever reason to her with her preliminary information, she saw the animal sealed in a plastic bag with some flesh on there to her. It looks like a, a real animal, but there's never been another one of these found in the history of science. So God forbid, there's any reason why she got duped and her name gets associated with this fact that she got had by one of her students and this thing was a some sort of a hoax somehow even though it certainly doesn't look like it then her name forever forever is associated with being someone who got tricked into some uh, uh, a tomfoolery and she looks like an idiot and then th she's never going to be able to shake that it's almost like somebody being accused of a certain type of crime you know even if the person isn't guilty if they put your name on the front page of that paper and they say hey you are accused of this thing this this level of corruption even if 12 weeks later you're on page 15 and there's a little blurb stating well this person was found absolutely exonerated from this crime that person will always be associated with the fact that they were on the front page of that paper and accused of that crime. So it's like the same way with like these cases of like high strangeness, you know? So it doesn't shock me that, you know, like you said, when you're looking into these aspects of these open cases and law enforcement that just, you know, especially when they get really, really strange that certain people just don't want to talk about them and they don't want any, any information coming out about them because there's certainly something going on here beyond the scope of just some sort of uh, hoax or something like that, you know? So, but, um, you know, Christopher, I certainly appreciate you, you coming on. Not media looks like we, uh, again, for some reason lost Christopher. Um, certainly appreciate him having on the, uh, this, th this episode of not media, I'm going to make sure to include, I'm going to contact him now and make sure to include his website and any other information. Um, you could check out his book. Like I said, when I first started this uh, podcast, I read his book in order to do this podcast. It's called stalking the herd. It's a comprehensive history on, uh, uh, cattle mutilations. And there was another book that he wrote before that called stalking the tricksters. And, um, you could just check out anything by Christopher O'Brien. seems like he's just done so much and co contributed so much towards this, um, towards this field of investigation. So, but I certainly appreciate everybody for watching. And again, I appreciate having Christopher on. I will include whatever links uh, are to his book and to any of the projects that he has worked on um, starting and leading up until where we're at now at, for his look into the animal and cattle mutilation mystery. Again, I appreciate everybody joining us. Thank you very much. JP signing off here for this episode of not media. Everybody stay well. Thanks again, Christopher, for coming on. Bye.
Thank you all for listening to this episode, and thank you everyone who has chosen a life of service. This is not just military, fire, police, and EMS, but also anyone who has taken their talents and passions and used them for the service and betterment of others and this world. I'm not saying goodbye. I'm saying until next time. This is your host, At Not Media, JP, signing off. Stay well, everyone. Mm-hmm.